Meetings from Doro. Revisiting Tourism, a trip through Digital and Circular Trends webinar. The host for today, Hugo Marquez Sosa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this journey. Uh, this webinar is being promoted by IATUR, which is here uh, represented by its president, which is a small uh, SME's uh, association from the regions of uh, Tras Montes and the Douro Valley, and that has come today to the beautiful and green University of Aveiro, which, will, which accepted our challenge to host this event. We thank you very much, the university, and congratulate in this 46th anniversary, which is marked also today, and Professor Carlos for setting this challenge. We also welcome very much uh, our international speakers, which have, um, have made the effort to come with us. I hope you enjoy this session as much as we will. And also would like to thank uh, the ones who came here, despite the rain, and uh, also our audience online for this webinar. So, our, start, our session will start with a panel around digital trends uh, till 11.10, then we'll have a, a short uh, coffee break, and afterwards we will restart our trip with uh, circular and sustainable trends, always regarding tourism. Uh, this event is part of a project uh, being promoted by IATUR called Meetings from Douro, which is co-financed by the program Portugal 2020, and that sets uh, this collaborative vision. That's why uh, IATUR came to, to Aveiro, like he has come to many other places. We'll also go to Brazil and Chile in this project, and the idea is to leave the vine, vineyards of the Douro region and to meet with other partners, other persons from other sectors, and understanding uh, how this can be an enhancement to their activity. But before we sail on this uh, journey, I would like to present you a short video regarding the project. Não vem para aqui a prudente navegação de captagem, que é de tão pouca sabedoria e tão escassa coragem, pois sabemos que ambas costumam ir de braço dado quando a necessidade as casou a sua última esperança. Aqui apenas conta quem acrescentou espaço ao tempo e cruzou caminhos a povos uns a outros estranhos, chocando culturas e ovos daninhos de preconceitos, armando sextantes mapas e instituições negras, revolvendo o pousio pacífico da terra orvalhada. Foi uma viagem de circunavegação em todos nós, o fechar do círculo das cores e da escala de Mós, o espaço medido pelo tempo na equação da velocidade, O tempo ganhando espaço, o tempo medida espaços, no circo vicioso e geocêntrico da esfera celeste. O projeto Meetings from Douro pretende levar o Douro ao mundo e trazer o mundo ao Douro. O Douro da luz que amanhece em nós e nos desperta. O dor do bem receber, com as suas gentes genuínas de olhar sincero e aberto. Uma gente hospitaleira e orgulhosa da sua terra e dos tesouros que ela guarda. O dor da natureza intocada, imponente, contemplativa. Uma natureza que nos entra a alma adentro e explode de plenitude. Uma natureza preservada e respeitada. Única na sua expressão de destino, que queremos sustentável e socialmente responsável. O dor da história, da nossa história, a mais antiga região vinícola de mercado do mundo. Património mundial da humanidade, terra de séculos de heranças que esculpem um património natural, cultural e arquitetónico ímpar. O dor das paisagens únicas de cortar a respiração. O dor que é moderno, sem deixar de ser tradicional e que sabe apostar na tecnologia e na inovação. Douro, um território com tanto para contar. So, without further ado, I ask, please, uh, Professor Carlos to start the digital part of our event. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning to you all. You are very welcome to the University of Aveiro and to this auditorium. This is the Department of Economics, Management, Industrial Engineering and Tourism. 
We have a great pleasure to host this session, the session called uh, Revisiting Tourism, a trip through digital and circular trends. Today, we are going to have two sessions. Let me talk about the, the first one. This is the panel I'll be the pleasure of being uh, uh, chairing. Professor Dimitris Bohalis is one of the leading academics in the world in this, in this area, and Dimitris is also a friend of the University of Aveiro, is also one of our members of our research center. Stanislav Ivanov is also a great friend. He's always available whenever we need, and he was also in the previous Invitur conference three years ago, and next year we are going to have the fifth edition of the Invitur conference. So, Stanislav, thank you very much for coming. Our colleague from the university, Professor Diogo Gomes, is from the Department of Electronics and uh, Information Technology, uh, and is also a colleague. And one of the things that we are doing in this department is to increase the links between the Department of Economics and the Department of Electronics and uh, Telecommunications. And let me also thank all the other guests that we are going to uh, see here today, Cinzia de Marzo, Rogelio is our, one of our PhD students and he was also uh, having a presentation. Hugo de Souza, Stefan Lazic, and many other people that will be here. Let me also uh, thank uh, Engineer Luis Marques. He is the president or vice president of IETUR, the association that is organizing also this, this conference. Uh, well, they are in, in fact organizing the conference and we are here in the university. We are hosting the conference. And let me also thank you all for coming and our audience. We are live streaming this conference, which is also very good in order to take uh, what we are discussing here uh, uh, outside. Let me just say a few words before we start. We all know that tourism is gaining muscle in the world and tourism is becoming the world's largest industry. The world cannot survive, I would say, without tourism. Things are changing. You know, the, 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 the world economics are changing, mostly from man manufacturing and a number of services to a leisure society and in particular to a tourism society. I would say that. And tourism is very much about connectivity. And when we talk about movement and we talk about connectivity, we have to start thinking that this is not only about movement and physical movement of people. What we also have to understand is that we have to take images, we have to take knowledge, and we have to take innovation uh, further and further. So one of the things that we have to consider is the important played, placed by and played by the digital world in these particular areas. And one of the things that we academics very often fail to do is to link the problems concerning and the ideas concerning the economics and management of the tourism sector and its practice and in particular technology. So the link between the economics and management and technology are still uh, 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 unveiled and from now I've, I'm supposed, and even yesterday we were having dinner and we were discussing this. I mean, one of the things that we have to do is to publish more research concerning this liaison, this link between the economics and management of tourism and technology. So this is what we are going to address today. And we have a very rich panel here. And I'm going to start with the Professor Dimitrius Bohalis, and I'm going to give him the floor immediately, so in this way, we will not lose our time. Thank you very much, Dimitrius. The floor is yours. Thank you. Bon dia, alegria. <laughs> Always fantastic to be back in Portugal, and Aveiro is my home. Carlos, my Irma. Um, so it's fantastic to be back and to share some of the views of what's happening around the world in terms of smart tourism, real-time tourism, nowness and ambient tourism. Um, we are about, what, 10 days to 2020. And we are 10 years to 2030. These 10 years will change the world of tourism dramatically. And anything that we're doing before is becoming rapidly 
irrelevant because tourism is changing using all the capabilities of technology that's emerging out there. There's a lot of research we've been doing in, in uh, Bournemouth University about smart tourism and developments and how all of those things will enable us to improve wellness, well-being, and provide benefits to all stakeholders of tourism around the world. And we'll have the opportunity to talk about some of those things. But the critical thing is, what I really want you to remember is that tourism in the next 10 years will be transformed so dramatically that most of the things that we knew in the past are becoming irrelevant. And we need to start looking into a whole range of new techniques, methods, and, and methodologies to actually take advantage of the technological developments to maximize the value for all the stakeholders in the marketplace. We are starting with data integration. It will be about getting everything together in one of these little machines, a smart machine, that will know everything about the context and everything about you. In the past, we used to look for information. Now information is looking for us. And information will be available to you before you request it. And it will be customized, individualized, personalized, and contextualized. So you'll have the information coming straight to you. I don't know if you're using one of those things. I don't. But hey, Google, can you bring me a pizza? Or the Alexa family. That is happening everywhere, and it's coming somewhere near you. Uh, and it's controlling a whole range of different things. The reason why we need smartness is because people would like to have access to this information and they understand the value that this information is bringing to you. So we've got personalization, contextualization, towards co-creating experiences. And the most important thing is instant gratification. People do not like something to happen one day. They would like it to happen now. Okay. And that leads us to nowness that we'll talk later on. So what's happening is that people would like to have the information that is addressing their needs at this particular time towards co-creating co experience. And personalization is happening pre-travel, before I travel, during, in terms of real-time engagement, and post-travel, sharing travel experience. Now, I consider Aveiro my home. I've been here, I don't know, 15 times. And um, I said to Carlos uh, last night, I said, let's go to Tellero, because Tellero normally is closed on Monday. We went to Tellero, Tellero was closed Sunday night as well. That bit of information I didn't know. If I knew that information, I would have been to Tellero on a Saturday night. Okay. So my computer here got the wrong information or failed to update in real time that Tellero is now closing Sunday night. And the post-travel, the post-travel is quite interesting. It's how do we engage with destinations once we have been there? So if I see a lot of things about Portugal, I more or less look at it. But when I see things about Aveiro, I'm really hooked to it because that's my home. I care about Aveiro. And that goes to, differ, to many different places where I care about. Smartness is not about technology. Smartness is about networks. And that's really, really important to understand. When we're talking about smart cities, smart um, networks, smart tourism, it's all about networks. It's not about one individual organization. And it's all about interoperability and interconnectivity of networks towards maximizing the value for everybody who is involved in this, in this business. To do that, we need to re-engineer process and data in order to produce innovative services, products, and procedures to maximize the value. Okay. So a lot of people, you hear a lot of people going around and they are talking about smartness. And anything that has got anything to do with technology, they call it smart. In fact, it's stupid. Because unless you connect all the technologies together, and unless you have got the interoperability, interconnectivity, and you break the silos, it's stupid technology. It does not do anything. Okay. 
the re-engineering enables shaping of products, action process, and, and services in real time to engage all the different stakeholders simultaneously to optimize the collective performance and competitiveness and generate agile solutions and value for all involved in the system. I'll give you a few of the, um, a few of the publications we have done that explains those definitions and how they work and where they're coming from. But basically, when we're talking about smartness, we talk about networks, and we talk about interoperability, interconnectivity, we talk about the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything, which brings everything together. We talk about sensors and beacons, sensors collect information, beacons send information out. We talk about big data and data analytics. And it's quite interesting that a lot of people are collecting awfully a lot of data, but they have no idea what to do with it. And especially what we call the last mile. The last mile is what you actually do with the data. And how can you predict things and create value. Social media, Web2, and user-generated content, technological enablers, and service-dominant logic towards co-creation competition. Those things are going to change tourism in the next 10 years. They are already here, but we don't use them properly. If I come to the Duro Valley and I go around, most of the information that you connect is based on silos. The train does not speak with the cruise, um, the cruise operators. It does not talk with the wineries. It doesn't talk with the taxi drivers, the transportation. So you've got to do it all your own. And of course, a lot of people have got, they create value out of for themselves. So the taxi drivers, they would like you to miss the boat so you can use their services. Or the wineries, they don't want to work with the other wineries so they think that you can go to one place. The, competitive of the, the competitiveness of the region will be really about bringing all of those things together, to operate together, to maximize my experience. If I would like to come to the Duro Valley, I would like to go to three wineries, and I'd like to engage in, with many different people and understand a whole range of different things. So it's all about interconnectivity, interoperability of all the different players in order to maximize the value at this particular moment, for this particular customer. I emphasize that this particular moment because yesterday it was raining quite badly. So I wouldn't go to wineries outside, but I'll go to wineries inside. And I'll try a lot of wine. So the product changes according to the context, and according to the nowness. Okay. Um, and, and that's something that we don't do. We create brochures. We still create paper brochures. We put them out there, and we expect that this process will do for everybody and all time. It doesn't. In December, Duro Valley looks very different than in May or in June. And the product is very different. But we don't understand that. We don't engage with that. <coughs> so this is some of the uh, publications that are coming now, that where technological disruption services lessons from tourism and hospitality where we look into how technology is creating disruption at the micro level and the macro level. And we explain what technologies are going to change a lot of those things. And the technologies that we'll do, uh, and Diego is probably going to be talking about that later, is interoperability through uh, telecoms and 5G. The RFID, artificial intelligence, mobile wearables, uh, apps, cryptos, and blockchains that bring a whole range of, sin of, of, of innovations like smart environments, data protection, cybersecurity, gamification. And then when you come to the marketplace, on the one side you've got the supply side, on the other side you've got the demand side. And you've got different technologies happening in the middle. Virtual reality, augmented reality, location-based services, and autonomous devices, autonomous vehicles. And a lot of those things are going to change the way we operate. Because imagine that the taxi is going to arrive at the time you need it. And that, that vehicle will coordinate with all the other players down on your, on your itinerary, on your travel itinerary. And that will manage everything together. So we're going towards context-based. We're talking about nowness, and we're talking about real-time tourism. And real-time tourism is looking into what's happening everywhere around, collects information and data from wherever data and information is available. Some of it is user-generated data based on, on, on um, social media. 
Some of it is coming from um, timetables, um, official things, but also a lot of information is coming from um, uh, telecom companies, Google, and anybody who's collecting data in real time. So my, my, Google, my Google machine knows what is the traffic from here to Porto, knows if there's an accident, knows how long I'll take from here to, to there. Carlos was saying yesterday, we've got 200 meters to go to the restaurant. And I said, no, it's not 200 meters, it's more. So we had a, a bet and he lost because it was, because it was 300 meters. And uh, Google knew better than the local person, right? And it's all about those things. So what's happening is that you've got internal context in terms of task and purpose, company familiarity with the area, topics of interest, emotional uh, status, goals and likes, preference, abilities, disabilities. That's your internal context. And here you've got the external context in terms of location, weather, social environment, season time, political situation, traffic, emergency, delays, air pressure, and light. All of those things are, are the external environment. And then you've got the situation in the middle where you've got travelers on the one side, you've got travel industry on the other side, and you've got the connected devices bring the interconnectivity to make the magic happen, the magic moment where um, the tourists and the locals and the residents and the local resources are getting together to co-create value and co-create benefits for everybody who is involved. Uh, sensors are everywhere and all of us are now carrying sensors. Your mobile is a sensor, your car is a sensor, um, devices that you've got at home, devices that we've got on the road are sensors and they're collecting information. Now, up until now, most of this information is collected, put on a database, analyzed, and create a report. So the best you can hope for, for the time being, is someone telling you that in the month of June, last year, we had um, so many tourists coming into the place. If you are lucky, they'll collect information about the museum that they visited, you'll get information about occupancy on each hotel. If you are lucky and you talk to the tax office, they'll tell you how much money they spend in each of the places. Now, you get most of this information from about three months after the, the event to three years after the event. I'm not a historian. I'm not interested in what has happened in the last three years. I really want to forecast uh, forward and say what's going to happen because in two months' time, if I'm busy, I may have to take pricing decisions. If I'm empty, I may have to take um, decisions about what I do. And I may co-create events. I may do a whole range of things. If I've got a lot of concentration of tourists in one place, and I'm not going to use the bad word over tourism, I did it. If you've got a lot of people that we know that they're going to arrive in one place because we've got heat maps, will make sure that we'll create a balance in different places so we ensure sustainability of resources and taking people around. Uh, increasingly, we'll have wearables, so we'll take a whole range of different information from the bodies of people. So we'll understand in real time what's happening. Are people happy? Are people unhappy? Are people, uh, what is the situation in that particular place for this particular individual? And what can a service do to improve that? And then social media will collect a lot of information, will analyze the information to understand what is the public mood. What's the public mood in Aveiro today? What people are thinking about Aveiro today? What people are thinking about Hong Kong today? What people are thinking about Brexit today? Okay, you now start understanding the nowness, the real time, and what people are, are doing. And this uh, from Brian Solis, the conversation prism which is collecting information from wherever the information is actually updated. And then this information is being listened. We listen to what's happening, engage, learn, and co-create, and come to you as a brand or as an individual to understand what are the implications of what is happening and how can you take advantage of your environment to maximize the value for everybody who is involved. And then beacons are sending information to different players using mobiles and whatever else they're using. 
Now, the next few slides are coming from a good friend of mine called Alex Rayner. And um, Alex works with Position, Position, Position and several other organizations to collect data from wherever, analyze data and understand, understand what's happening. And through tourism statistics, work with um, a range of different organizations and authorities to create benefits for destinations in different areas and maximize the, the benefit for that. So if you've got maps like that, you understand where people are, you understand what are the hot points, and you understand how to manage the hot points. <coughs> you understand the, and, and, and the proxy of that is of course the mobile phone, because we can track mobile phones, we don't track people, but you can understand what time people go where, and what's happening with the movements. So you'll understand what's the concentration level in different places. I like this. This is called the, uh, the ants graph. Uh, and I've got to play it here. Yeah. This is the traffic between Finland, Helsinki, and Tallinn, Estonia. And you can see in 24 hours what's happening. But because you understand, you understand which are the routes that they are heavy, you understand when they are used, and you understand what to do with that. That is the benefit of the big data. That's the benefit of, of smartness. To understand where people are going, why they are going, and what, what um, methodology, you, you know, what method do they use to transport. And actually optimize systems together by bringing all of those things together. There are companies like, um, like Position that they are doing these things. And a lot of mobile operators have got this data, but they're not set up to actually make real-time uh, real decisions for the time being. They are still doing uh, reports. But this is something we are going to get to. And if I've got this data, and if I can cross-tabulate with individual, with individual um, internal context, and also I can cross-tabulate with external context, so I say, if it rains, that's the pattern of behavior. If it doesn't rain, that's the pattern of behavior. You can create value by doing a whole range of different things. And for your Duro Valley, this is inv invaluable because you've got, you've got a terrain that's quite complicated and you've got different users. So someone who's going to Porto on a conference will have a very different behavior than someone who's going to Porto on a wine exploration. And someone who is going to Porto for the first time, they'll have very different patterns of behavior than someone who's gone there for the fourth time. And all of those things are coming into contextualization of tourism and understanding how tourism management and marketing needs to operate. And that's what's going to bring us competitive advantage. So you understand where the tourists are going and what are the attraction centers. And someone was telling me about Venice early on, but. You know, if, if all your travelers are going to San Marcos Square in a particular time, of course you'll have problems. The question is how do you develop alternative attractions and how do you attract people in different places to engage in those things? Um, so a lot of these things are not new. And this is my smart tourism framework where you've got data coming out of the tourism supply. They're going up on the cloud. They're being analyzed. They, with a value aggregator, and they come as a, as a storm of value down to the consumers before providing feedback back to the suppliers. This loop is not new. We have always done it. What is new is the speed of what we're doing. So what used to happen is that people will collect information, they'll think about it, they'll create another five-year strategy that's going to go on itself, and then they'll create data over the five years, and they'll say, oh, perhaps we need to invest in this bridge. OK. What is new is the speed of these things. I create a package, I put it out, I send up on the cloud, it arrives to the customers in two seconds, and I see what happens. How many people did they buy a package that says, I'm going to go on a cruise, I'm going to go to three wineries, and I'm going to end up with a dinner and um, wine um, uh, degustation kind of dinner. And if that worked, I'll do more of this. If th that didn't work, I'll understand why it didn't work and I change the offering. And the thing is, I'll do it in within, within half an hour. And I'll try different things. 
And then I'll collect information to understand the patterns and I'll constantly change. So tourism is going to better, constant better. And that's agility. It's really about how do we have agile products that they are constantly evolving and they're constantly on better. There's no menu, basically. I go to restaurants and they give me a menu. And I see the same menu in Tellero for the last 15 years. And I love it. <laughs> but at the same time, that menu does not take into consideration my preference does not take into consideration what I can pay and what I cannot pay. It doesn't take into consideration what is the season. It doesn't take into consideration that this year you had a lot of, um, uh, you didn't have a lot of water and therefore you've got different foods. Okay, all the contextual information is not there. And that's what we are going to. We are going to really contextualizing everything we do and make sure that everything is optimized. We are talking about personalized experience where tourism employees are coming on the one side, tourists are going on the second, on the other side, and then we have got personal encounters. That is the magic moment. Can I create a magic moment for you where I take your breath away and you say, wow, wow, that's incredible, that's fantastic. And that creates value for time, back to what we're discussing. Not only value for time, value for money. Because let's face it, people can pay quite a lot for different things. But what we find is really difficult to actually inspire people to want to give us their money. Because when you are traveling a lot like I do, you see the same product over and over and over again. The same souvenirs made in China and Taiwan over and over and over again. I was saying to Carlos yesterday, uh, three years ago, the first um, experience shop opened in Aveiro. Now there are 15 experienced shops selling exactly the same thing. The first guy was really innovative, right? Yesterday I went to Continente and I bought um, sardines and tuna on a tin. Because that is coming back in Portugal. With a little bit of nostalgia and a little bit, wow, that's our heritage. And they had some beautiful kind of uh, packaging, all that for 89 cents. If I was buying it on the souvenir shop, exactly the same product, it was two pound, two euros fifty, uh, with a little bit of more packaging and much more branding, right? But the sardine was the same. Um, so it's all going about understanding what is the value, and looking to what can you, as Portugal, as any place, Bali, as Greece, as England, differentiate yourself, and being a unique experience, create that magic moment at that particular moment. So it's all about how we operate these things. And normally when I talk about smart tourism, people think that it's about uh, technology. In fact, it's not about technology. It's about people, human capital, social capital, knowledge management, and leadership. How do governments, organizations like yourselves, listen to these guys, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, you don't do that. Because this is really important here. Excuse me, you don't do it. I'll start again. Smartness is not about technology. Smartness is about people, knowledge management, and it's about leadership. And this is where you have got responsibility. Your associations, the people bring together. It's all about bringing the leadership in participatory governance. It's policies and regulations and change management. It's all about bringing people together and to understand what are the challenges and take them to the next stage. Smartness is not because technology guys brought new gadgets then they ask you to use. Smartness is about bringing smartness economic actors, social actors and technological actors together in a social and value co-creation ecosystem that brings together the innovations to make things happen. It's not about technology, it's about leadership. And that's where you've got the responsibility to bring everybody together to understand how they can use these things to make sure that they create smart innovation. This is uh, from uh, Korea, I was in Seoul recently, and this is something that's called TAPIS, which is the control center of, of, of Seoul in Korea. They've got 30,000 cameras 
30,000 cameras in Seoul, Korea. Collect the information, bring all this information in. They understand what is, how busy is edge of the street. They understand when there is a problem in real time and deploy security, they deploy emergency services, police, fire brigade, whatever, to actually deal with these things. And they've got these indicators here. This is about tsunamis and earthquakes. They understand what is the level of the impact that's going to happen and how fast they need to react. And the, the, the more, you know, if it's really, really bad, it goes to red. If it's so, yeah, it goes to amber, green, and blue. But it's all about getting all of these things in real time, get the feed, and actually manage those things. And this is my favorite one. It's a, it's a bus lane. So they're looking at the buses, and they see how busy each of the buses are. And if it's green, it's fine. If it's yellow, it's a little, getting a little bit busy and difficult. And if it's red, there's a problem. It may be delayed. It may be too many people are on the bus. And then they've got to do something. And my students normally ask me, how do they know how many people are on the bus? They have a sensor every time you come in, and they've got the sensor every time you go out. And they've got something under where you sit to recognize that there's someone on top of that seat. So they manage the situation in real time. And I go around to destination management organizations, um, Tourism Portugal, um, Duro Valley, and I say, well, how do you manage the destination? In fact, we don't. We have no idea what's happening in our destinations. And we don't manage. We only manage emergencies, but it's not even us managing it. It's the emergency services are, are managing. We don't know how many people are on the boats. We don't know how many people are. Uh, if, if I ask you tonight, how many people, how many rooms have you got available in Porto? I bet nobody knows. If I ask you tonight, how many, um, what's the average room rate in Porto tonight? I bet nobody knows. If I ask you, how many restaurant seats have you got tonight? And how many reservations you've got tonight as a destination? You don't know. This is the kind of stuff that we are going to. That we're going to optimize not only each business, but we'll optimize the destination together. We'll optimize the wineries, we'll optimize the hotels, we'll optimize all the resources. Because there's investment that comes from the local, local economy into those areas, and we need to actually get um, return on investment for the residents and the local people around it. The last bit is really about smart solution. Uh, and actually, um, the following presentations and Stanislav and other colleagues are going to talk about that, so I'm going to go very, very quickly. The sharing economy, the autonomous vehicles and drones, that's going to change dramatically things. Artificial intelligence, big data management, real time, and robots. Nowness is all about understanding location-based services, mentions, hashtags, sentiment analysis, trending topics, keywords, and competitors, and understand what's happening at the destination right now. What's happening in my business right now? How can I go back and actually uh, react to that? What are the wants and the expectations of the customers? What's near me? Any recommendations? It doesn't work. Can you please help? Terrible service. Can you fix something? But I don't want you to fix it in three months. I don't care. I would like you to fix it while I'm here. OK. And then digital touch points through social media and all kinds of things where people are uploading all kinds of information. Do you have time to play this? Yeah? This is what, um, I don't have sound coming out. Uh, this is about uh, Marriott Hotels. Marriott Hotels have actually implemented what I've been talking about for many years. And they've done the 5M Live Centers that collect information from anything that's around them. The okay, the next time you're at a restaurant, gonna explain. like a cheesecake factory, or maybe, I don't know, we're going to find out. At a ball game or on vacation, everything you post on social media sites may be monitored. Yeah, go back. What have you done? I've done. Okay. Okay. The next time I'm you're at a restaurant, like a cheesecake factory, or maybe I don't know. We're going to find out. At a ball game or on vacation, everything you post on social media sites may be monitored by the company which owns the venue. You may be being watched by a number of Fortune 500 companies. The growing use of a technology called geofencing, making it easier for companies to listen in on customers' public conversations. The goal is to better engage with them and increase their brand presence, awareness, and then hopefully, sales.
At Marriott's corporate headquarters in Maryland, they call this glass-enclosed room M Live. It's a modern-day command center for the hotel chain where employees constantly monitor social media platforms such as Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Every day, more than 300,000 guests post on social media from a Marriott property. Executives know this because of a technology called geofencing. Each yellow dot's a hotel or a location. Marriott has geofenced more than 4,000 properties worldwide. Okay, that means basically in the area around a hotel, with the conversations that are on social media, we can tell who's geographically around that hotel. And they watch as guests post about everything, from breakfast in bed in Amsterdam to pool selfies in the Caribbean. Sometimes Marriott reposts them using their account, and sometimes they reach out to the customers directly. So when a guest posts about a special occasion, for example, like a birthday or an engagement, the team here can notify the manager of the hotel and that guest can get a special something like a bottle of champagne or perhaps a free appetizer at dinner, maybe a room upgrade. It's designed to make the customer feel special, not spied on. The idea that you can see what people are posting within a geographic area, do you worry that that creeps out your customers? We think that the people who are actually on social media are delighted at the, the, the ability to have us amplify their conversation. The CEO. So I'm playing this video because quite often people are looking at me and say, yeah, yeah, you're saying great, Bukhalis, but actually our tourism doesn't work like that. And what you say is academic. It isn't. It's basically a new way of thinking. It's management of destinations and resources by having realistic information in real time, it's co-creation of value in real time, and it's nowness. It's understanding who is consuming value, why, when, where, now, and maximizing the value for them. And the companies who are already doing that, like Marriott, they take advantage of the things that we've been talking for a lot of time. Um, in this paper, we talk about the sources of competitive advantage. On the one side, it's always been price. If it's cheap, people will buy it. Or if it's different. So it's a good brand, it meets my requirements, I'll buy it. The third thing that is bring, we are bringing out as a source of competitive advantage is time and nowness and instant gratification. You'll find that when you get out of, of this room, you're going to go for a coffee. You're not going to go and find the best coffee in the world or the cheapest coffee in the world but you'll go next door and you'll buy the coffee that will instantly gratify your needs, okay? If you walk for an, a mile, you'll find the cheaper coffee. And if you walk for three miles, you buy it, you'll find the better coffee. But actually you'll buy the, the, the product that instantly gratifies your needs. And time is becoming the next thing of competitive advantage that's, that needs um, real-time data mining and come back with a value in real time. I'll leave robots to Stalin's now uh, to talk about them, and this is Hena Hotel in Japan. Um, but I'll talk about um, the transformation of labor. This is housekeeping and this is cleaning. And normally people are asking by that time, is the robot going to take my job? And I say yes. If you're a cleaner, it will take your job. And then I'm asking anybody, are you really, do you really want to be a cleaner? Do you want your kids to be a cleaner? And a lot of those, or do you want to deliver a sandwich at 3 o'clock in the morning on room service? Or would you like a robot to, to go and do it? And quite often people think, oh, robots are never going to happen, you know. And it happens. Uh, this is my friend. Philip in the New Century Grand Hotel in Hangzhou in China last month, where he was following me around. He could speak English. The receptions couldn't, but they're happening. So ambient intelligence tourism is the last bit I'm going to talk about, and this is going to change the world. Ambient intelligence means that smart systems will be introduced to everyday environments, propelling interconnectivity and interoperability of all systems, vehicles, and devices through the internet of everything. We'll have technical developments like artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, that bring ambient connectivity through wider area uh, networks, Wi-Fi and 5G, autonomous vehicles and robotics, and will bring interconnected devices and uh, environments that they maximize the value generated. So when your car 
is talking to your bathroom and say, hi, the guy has just got into the car, will be at home in 20 minutes and he would like to have a bath, start heating up the bathroom for us. This is when we're talking about these things. And by the way, the refrigerator is sending a message to Continente and says, um, we've run out of milk. So Continente is sending a message to the car and say, can you please stop on your way? And I've got a, uh, milk waiting because your refrigerator uh, said that I need to bring milk. I've already um, charged your, um, your financial systems. I say credit card, but in China, you have no credit card anymore. You've got Alipay and you've got WeChat Pay and all of, all of these things. Um, this is what we're talking about. Ambient intelligence are bringing mobile systems that are portable, wireless, network, location, sensitive, and secure. They're pervasive in terms of ubiquitous, interactive, interoperable, distributable, and scalable. And the ambient in terms of embedded, context-aware, personalized, adaptive, and anticipatory. They anticipate your needs before you realize your needs. They anticipate that your milk would have finished before the milk will finish. And they'll predict when the, the, the milk will finish. And they'll predict when the, the milk is going to get out of date. OK. And if you've got a particular thing, like a gluten allergy or whatever, because the system knows about it, it's going to go to all the, all the restaurants out there and say, which restaurant can actually do me a gluten-free meal? Can I come back and scale that and say, out of the 40 restaurants in Aveiro, in six restaurants, people, celiacs with gluten-free allergy, have said that they've got, they had a fantastic experience. So choose out of those, because it's an individualized, personalized, contextualized kind of experience. Um, machines will be talking to each other, and Stanislav is going to talk about the machines who talk to about each other. And we'll have a situation like that when drones, autonomous vehicles, computers, everything will be talking to everybody. And hopefully they'll be talking to us, but that's another, another lecture. And you'll have ambient intelligence where the visitors are right in the middle. They've got a, a range of different players and tourism and hospitality uh, stakeholders around them. And they'll use the internet of things, internet of everything, 5G, RFID, mobile devices and wearables, uh, applications, cryptocurrencies, sensors and beacons, pervasive computing gamification, artificial intelligence to bring all of these things together now for you. And this is about how we are, we are going. Smartness is not about technology, it's about agility and value co-creation. And some of you may have seen this that happened to me in China some time ago at the famous Hanzhou Blossom Water Museum Hotel, where the chambermaid realized I was doing a presentation I said, dear Professor Buchalis, that you would speak tomorrow in order to better protect your throat, I specially prepared for you a candy. And she left that in my, in my room. This is the same level of care with my mother. OK. That is smart. There is no technology involved, but super smart. So. Thank you very much. That's a long list of, pres of publications that this presentation is based on and all the things that we do on the e-tourism lab in, in Bournemouth University. Thank you very much. Obrigadissimo. Thank you very much for coming. And in the meantime, you are going to listen to Professor Stanislav. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be back to Aveiro. Uh, I will talk about robots, artificial intelligence, and service automation in travel, tourism, and hospitality. So my presentation is uh, a continuation of uh, the presentation of uh, Dimitrios, which we just uh, heard. So a uh, few words about myself. I'm professor in tourism economics and vice rector of research at Varna University of Management. Also editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Tourism Research. CEO of a small consulting company and member of uh, IES. So uh, the presentation is largely based on this uh, book, which was published just uh, two months ago. Uh, 
which with the same name, Robots, Artificial Intelligence and Service Automation, Travel, Tourism and Hospitality. And this is the reaction of ladies when they see the book. So boys, please buy as many copies as possible. Yeah, Christmas presents. And this is the reaction of robots when they read the book. So um, a few slides, uh, a few promotional slides. I'm uh, also editing a special issue of tourism economics on the economics of revenue management. And uh, uh, special issue in uh, tourism management perspectives together with uh, uh, Urke Gretzel and Ian Yeoman on tourism beyond humans, robots, pets, and teddy bears. So if you're interested, please do submit your best papers there. And I'm also involved in a project uh, that looks uh, to the skills that employees in tourism and hospitality would need in uh, 10 years from now. Now, robots have arrived. So when people hear robots, they usually have this impression. They think about these robots. OK, they are great. They are fantastic. But uh, for Hollywood, we are not talking about such robots. Other people have this impression. Uh, they see that ro uh, they think that robots will come and they will destroy our, our world. This is also a wonderful scenario for Hollywood, and it generates a lot of billions of dollars, but this is not going to happen at least for the near future. And uh, also other people, especially from the transhumanist movement, they think that humans and robots will merge, so we shall have the next stage of uh, evolution. We are not talking about such robots in this uh, presentation. We are talking about these robots, who doesn't have a car in this room. OK, so uh, what we can say is that most of the cars are practically manufactured by robots, not by humans. And uh, uh, it's, practically the rob it's practically the robots that are replacing uh, uh, the employees in car manufacturing companies. It is not the Mexicans. So, uh, so, probably, uh, so probably in the US, they should, they should not construct the great Mexican wall, but the great robotic wall. If they want, uh, so you see uh, the reaction of the robot hearing that uh, the human input does not want to be replaced. Also, we use, uh, we use robots in warehousing, for agriculture, autonomous cars, in medicine. This, uh, uh, these uh, medical robots, they can perform the operation in a much better, much, much better way than uh, human surgeons. But of course, they assist the uh, human surgeons. This is the dream of every single general in the world, to be able to bomb the enemies without sending troops there, military drones. Also, this is my dream, <laughs> doing the vacuum cleaning at home. Uh, and of course, we, can, we have robots in uh, swimming pools, for cutting the grass in gardens, uh, for guards. Of course, this robot will not arrest you. But as a vigilant citizen, this robot will report you to the person who can arrest you. And parcel delivery, the competition currently is for the last mile delivery from the warehouse to the home of, uh, uh, of the customer. We can use robots in uh, education, in entertainment, uh, for provision of information services, and uh, for legal services. For example, countries with, uh, Angus, uh, with a precedent type of legislation, like in uh, the US and the UK, um, lawyers need to sift through many cases in order to justify uh, that, in order to, to justify a case in, in court, so that this is where artificial intelligence can help. Also, in search engines, when we start writing something, miraculously, uh, the word, uh, we receive results which are quite relevant for us. Or when we buy something from, uh, on, uh, from uh, online stores, we start receiving recommendations for, complement, for uh, complementary products or products from the same uh, group. Or social media chatbots. If you, uh, if you send a message to the chatbot of the European Journal of Tourism Research on Facebook, it is not me that will provide you the answer. It's the chatbot. It's always great fun to read in the evenings the communication between the chatbot and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the humans. At least I suppose that it is human chatbot communication. Probably at one point it will be chatbot, chatbot communication. Uh, 
So please go like the page, send messages. I have to train the, uh, the algorithm there. Uh, also, in finance, we have high frequency trade. We have automated trading algorithms that open and close positions on the financial markets. And this happens within milliseconds. A human brain cannot process information with such a speed in order to react to small fluctuations in prices. Uh, also, we have voice-activated devices, uh, journalists will also be replaced uh, uh, by computer uh, programs. And, uh, uh, but also, robots can be smart-looking and attentive students. A photo from Enter Conference uh, this year in Nicosia. But also, they, are, can, they can be uh, cucumbers cutting robots. This is a special site for Ulrike Grezio. And uh, also, we can have robots for, uh, um, for reading uh, the Bible and other uh, religious books. And of course, we can have sex robots. Male, ro male sex robots always scan female sex robots, never complain and never have headaches. So this is also entering the market. And of course, if we think that uh, this is, this is, these are just uh, uh, fantasies, no, this is not. This is reality. Three years ago, the, um, the National Science and Technology Council uh, in the U.S. published, uh, published several reports for, uh, with, in which they say that, they, that the U.S. economy should be prepared for um, automated, uh, for, for autonomous agents and for robotics, sometimes uh, by 2025. Uh, one year later, in 2017, uh, OECD also published a report with similar forecasts. So, what about tourism and hospitality? We have uh, mobile applications, we have uh, robots, uh, we can have digital rece receptionists, uh, and, uh, of course, the room service delivery robots, as uh, we already saw. And the Henna Hotel, and this year, in the middle of uh, January, Henna Hotel turned off half of their robots. And uh, you can't imagine what happened in, on my Facebook wall, because uh, my friends on Facebook know how much I love uh, robots. So these are, these are screenshots of the articles they posted on my, on my wall. I thank, them, uh, I thank them because they practically found the information instead of me. Uh, so, these are um, the different, uh, these are the different uh, articles. They say that uh, Japan Robot Hotel fires most of its annoying robotic staff, etc. The general idea of all these articles is that the robots are not taking over the hospitality industry. Robots are uh, stupid and you see uh, the first robot hotel is a complete failure. Yes, but this is <laughs> far from the truth. We'll see later on. Also, we have, we have uh, different kiosks in uh, uh, restaurants. This uh, photo was, uh, of McDonald's was made pre in Porto. Uh, and we can have conveyor belt restaurants. We can have drones, so, but instead of sending us bombs, these drones can send us pizza bombs. And uh, we can have uh, automated uh, restaurants. Can we play this one? Whoops. It doesn't start. Okay, no problem. Then we can, we can track with mobile application about um, our, the delivery of uh, our orders. We can have uh, restaurants uh, uh, that have uh, robots as a host or as a waiter. Also, we can have automated restaurants without uh, 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 without much of the, of, uh, the staff, telepresence robots or robots for, uh, for bars. Uh, there is a cruise ship that is already equipped with such a robotic bar. For, we can have uh, uh, machines for, um, uh, for, um, for facial recognition so that uh, these are automated um, boarding gates. At airports or in urban transport, we can have applications that uh, help us uh, travel along. And uh, for travel agencies and information centers, we can have, this is, uh, we can have such uh, kiosks. This photo was made again in Portugal, but, this, but in Faro. And in museums, we can have uh, robots uh, uh, that deliver information, or we can have uh, 
virtual uh, reality application, digital assistants we already uh, uh, mentioned, but also chatbots. You can make bookings or you can receive information about uh, a destination through uh, chatbots. And uh, for car rental with uh, Zipcar, you can, uh, you can take the car, you can leave the car without, uh, without even encountering a human being in uh, the process. So my personal slogan is in robots we trust. When I, ask, uh, when I talk about robots, people often ask me, why? Why? Why not humans? But why robots? And this is my answer. This is the most important number in the history of the universe. No, it's not the impact factor of a journal. It's completely irrelevant. It is not the price of oil. It is not the number of people that still support Brexit. It's none of these. It is the number of children per woman. Because everything, all the future developments of societies will be determined by this number. Demography determines the world power. It's not money, it's not anything else. It's demography. So the number of children per woman. In biological terms, in order to keep a population, considering the constant, considering uh, fixed uh, mortality rates, we need something like 2.1 children per woman. Two children replace the two parents. One, uh, uh, 0.1 uh, child replaces the child mortality until, uh, un uh, until the age of 18. So we need something about 2.1. If we have less than that number, especially if it is much less than two, we shall have declining populations. Currently, populations are in, in Europe, in the US, in, uh, in, and uh, uh, in the uh, Far East. They're increasing, not because of increased birth rates, but by decreased mortality rates. So what happens? Which are the countries? The country with the lowest birth rate is Korea, the Republic of Korea. 1.05 children per woman. So will there be, uh, what will happen? It means you have two parents, you have only one kid. What will happen in 40 years? It's, there will be a huge decline in population there. Where's Portugal? 1.36 last year. Where's Japan? 1.43. So you're in the same group with Japan. Where's Bulgaria? 1.54. EU, 1.59. What does this mean? It means that the number of kids that are born are something like 25% less than necessary for replacement of the population. Every generation is 25% smaller than the previous generation. But what happens, what happens with the others, with, uh, with, in other countries like India, Indonesia, Egypt? We have much, much higher birth rates. So what are the solutions to this? We have, we, in the long term, we can, uh, in order to compensate for this, we can produce people with the normal biological process. But it's a long term, 40, 50 years, in order to have implication for the uh, market. We, but we can import people through immigration, but this can create a lot of social tension. But also, we can substitute people as a production factor. So automation technologies compensate for the unborn children. Companies are forced to use automation, not because they want it, but because they are not sufficient workers on the labor market. If we do not want to compete with robots, we have to reproduce. This is. Now, what about the economics of uh, these technologies? RUISA stands for Robots, Artificial Intelligence, and Service Automation. Uh, this, is the cons uh, this is the economic framework uh, from the book. It has two parts. We have here the tourism company, we, we have its competitors, and we have the customers. So uh, the business processes within the company, these are the marketing operations, human resources, and finance. We have the customers influencing the business op processes through the willingness of pay, perceived service quality, service, participation in the service process. If the introduction of, uh, these te of automation technologies, if they improve the competitiveness and the financial performance of the company, they also uh, they contribute positively to the cost-benefit analysis of uh, the company. So the, the company will balance the costs and the benefits for using these uh, technologies and to decide whether to invest. 
also what we have is the comparison, the decision whether to invest in such technologies depends on uh, the comparison between human employees and automation technologies as production factors. We have the substitution versus enhancement effect, which I uh, uh, discuss in, on the next slides. And the demand for, and when the company decides to use automation technologies, this influences the demand for these technologies, the supply, but also it influences the demand and supply for human uh, employees. Uh, now, why should racer technologies be uh, used and be adopted? First, because they work 24-7. You can have a 24-7 reception, you know, to have a 24-7 uh, uh, full uh, reception in a hotel, you need at least five employees. But you can have one kiosk. Also, they could implement various tasks and, inspect, and uh, expand the scope of, so, uh, of uh, these tasks by software and hardware upgrades. Constant and improving quality of the work. Or uh, they can work correctly and in a timely manner. They don't procrastinate. And also, they can do routine work repeatedly. They don't need to be motivated on this. Also, they don't comp robots do not complain, do not shirk from work, don't uh, quit their job without notice, don't show negative emotions, etc. But also, they don't go on strike. And this is what Chef Paul Patton says in Star Wars. Every strike of human employees is a pathway towards their substitution by automation technologies. Of course, he doesn't say this, but I'm reading his thoughts. So the force is strong with him, so we know what, uh, 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 we are sure that he, he has this in his mind. Also, we have, we have labor cost savings, increased sales, easier scheduling of operations, improved environmental sustainability. All these things, they contribute positively. Also, they, uh, also, these technologies, they increase the role of the customer. So customers are, pr are transformed into prosumers because the initiative for a service would, would, will be transferred to uh, the customers. And it, we can talk also about co-creation of, val of uh, value, yes. Uh, also, these technologies, they save employees time. So instead of a person uh, carrying the tray uh, from the restaurant to the room of the of, um, of the guest, a robot can do this. Enhancing rather than replacing employees, but also solve problems with hiring and firing employees. European legislation is very rigid towards firing. So some companies may not hire someone just because it will be very difficult to fire that person later on. How do, how do we hire and fire a robot? Turn on, turn off. Simple. We need a robot, we turn it on. We don't need the robot, we turn it off. But also, they can create, uh, they can enhance the perceived service quality by making the process uh, entertaining. And uh, we can, they can be used for auto, automation technologies, they can be used for automated pricing, personalized pricing, marketing, for marketing communications, for predictive analytics, for better forecasts. And companies that use such technologies, they can be perceived as um, innovative high tech companies with positive word of mouth. And of course, why not? We have, the, we have the bright side, but we also have the dark. Why? First, we have huge financial costs, upfront costs for acquisition, installation, maintenance, software upgrades, for creating robot-friendly environment within the hotel to facilitate the, movements of, the movement of uh, the robot. But we also have potential vendor walk-in effect. It means that once we uh, once we uh, use particular technology from a particular supplier, probably it will be very difficult to switch to another supplier, so we need to use that uh, uh, product. But leasing could be one of the ways to offset these high costs. Of course, robots lack creativity. They also decrease the flexibility of the service delivery system. At least for the moment, humans are much more flexible than technology. Also, they like personal approach, operate in structural situations, and also companies may suffer negative publicity because, uh, because the company may be perceived as, as a firm that puts profits before humans. And of course, technologies can wipe out whole sectors of the economy. 
uh, and uh, they can be perceived as threat for uh, human employees and, they, and customers and employees, society as a whole, may resist using these technologies. Of course, they, they will lead to the disappearance of industries. So this is one at, from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, of um, comparing horses versus automobiles and why you should use horses, not buy automobiles. No, we saw that horses went into the history of transportation. And of course, robots don't go to spa centers. This is a special slide for Metin Kozak. Greetings, Metin. So, also, what we can see in the future is that uh, we shall have division of co tourist companies into two large groups. High-tech companies, high-tech tourism, hospitality companies, which will offer um, cheap, they, they will offer uh, standardized but also lower priced pro, uh, hospitality products, but also we shall have uh, high touch with uh, services which are delivered by humans and also at higher prices. And of course between these two extremes there will be different shades of uh, gray. So are humans and robots substitutes or complements? So Tom was the first guy to lose his job due to artificial intelligence. But Tom was a cat. What can we say about the humans in that case? So uh, these technologies, they have both substitution and enhancement effect simultaneously. And the, and the effect depends on, two, on three things. Automation of tasks versus jobs, relative productivity of these technologies and the human employees, and the service capacity of a company. Now, when we, uh, uh, what, uh, um, in one highly cited article, uh, Frey and Osborne, it was cited last week 4,754 times. I think it's now more than 4,800 times. They reported that 47% of the jobs in the U.S. are subject to automation. Of course, we can challenge that article a lot on the basis of methodology. But uh, what we can say is that, th uh, that this number is really, would be really very high. So when we talk about automation, we talk about automation of tasks, not jobs. And in order to decide whether a job will be eliminated or not, it all depends on which tasks that particular job consists of. So if some tasks are automated and the set of tasks uh, that human employees need to perform decreases, we're talking about the skilling of jobs. It means that we can have employees with lower level of education that can uh, perform uh, these tasks. In the long run, these jobs, the, the whole job will be eliminated. However, if these tasks are automated, but, they are, but this automation allows the human employees to perform better on their job and to increase the productivity, we talk about the enhancement effect. So people will keep uh, their job. Relative productivity of race and human employees. If the revenues that, we, that a company receives per dollar cost of research technologies is higher than the revenues per dollar cost for human labor, then the company will have incentives to increase, to increase the use of technology rather than rely on human labor. And the opposite is uh, also uh, valid. What about the service capacity? If technologies increase the service capacity, then enhancement effect will prevail because the company will be able to serve more customers, to generate more revenues with the same number of employees. However, if we have fixed capacity, limited growth opportunities, then companies will focus on, um, on improving the operational efficiency and cutting costs. So in that case, substitu case substitution effect will prevail and uh, human employees may fear about uh, uh, their jobs. So recent technologies, they eliminate the tasks for some jobs. They will, uh, they will help reallocate re tasks to other jobs, but also they will create tasks for, uh, for existing or new job positions. So for some job positions in tourism, we can say that um, the substitution effect will prevail. For other job positions, the enhancement effect will prevail. And of course, as Dimitri said, technology is a tool. It is not the goal. And uh, we have to use technology wisely, effectively and efficiently. Because we may have wonderful robots, but, if they, and, but uh, 
if used in hospitality, at one point they may be transformed for something else which is completely not suitable for the hospitality. Thank you so much. Robots have arrived and are here to stay. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm going to invite Diogo and Dimitris to come back to the stage. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. It's a great pleasure to see you here. Let me also give the floor to Diogo, our colleague from the Department of Electronics and Telecommunications. And let me start by saying this. This university, maybe some of you don't know, but this university was created in 1973. And by that time, the university had the vision to create a department of electronics and telecommunications. And by that time, also, most of the degrees in Portugal and across the world were on electrical engineering. So, electronics and telecommunication was something really strange, I would say. And later on, I mean, the university also had the vision to create a department of ceramics and ceramics was mostly handicrafts in this country. And later on, in, in the 80s, also a degree on environmental engineering. And by that time, I mean, you know, the climate change was not an issue at all, and uh, the degree became a huge success. But let's go back to the Department of Electronics uh, 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 and Telecommunication. Diogo, what do you do in the department? Because, I mean, we have to leading experts in tourism. What do you do in terms of all these uh, things, technologies you have there? And how do you see the application to the tourism sector? Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm by far not a tourism expert. Uh, it was very nice to hear the, the presentations from my colleagues who are experts in tourism. Um, what, what we do in, um, in, in our department, and I will just use the, the English uh, acronym, which is ICT, Information, Communications and Technologies, is that we enable other areas. And this is very important because that's also part of the DNA of the university. We, we don't uh, have separate branches. We are all part of the same university, and we work a lot together. So in my, in my last year, I've been working with some colleagues from the tourism department, Exactly because I was approached by one student that wanted to do his PhD in bridging AI and, and tourism. And I found that as an interesting collaboration because it, it brings new opportunities. I'm not an expert, I've been learning a lot about it. But the, the possibilities that our colleagues here uh, explained to you about, they're, they're immense. And I'm, I'm an engineer, and engineers are about bringing solutions. Um, we, we do not predict things. We usually look at predictions and we see the path to make it real. That, that's our driving factor. So when we, when we talk with uh, people who think about new ideas and new approaches, we're, we're listening in and figuring out how to make that happen. So it is important that we all uh, look at those predictions for robots and we see, okay, I can do that, I can do that. Um, yeah, that is possible. And this, this is very important because this is what drives innovation. Um, I, I've been working in, uh, in 5G technologies. We already started working in 6G technologies. And we're mostly driven by uh, small uh, incremental aspects. But we always have the same driving factor, the technicalities of increasing speed, uh, increasing range. But the most important use cases for 5G are exactly the, um, the verticals. We call them the verticals, which is how to apply these technologies to vertical areas. Smart cities, smart manufacturing, smart tourism, the smart word, as, the, as Lali said, it's, uh, it's a very interesting word. It's everything is smart, but nothing so smart than, than it seems to be. And, uh, when we put in AI and we put in technology that enables or improves existing communications, we get to new players, we get to new audiences. 
we enable people that previously do not have access to such technologies. Um, I've been working, for instance, in a project related to chatbots. People have a chatbot in their Facebook page. How easy is it for an hotel to have a chatbot to talk with its customers? Hotel is a very large. What about a small rented uh, room? Can I have a chatbot? We're trying to make technologies available to all these people and they don't know how to use it. Does it make sense? And it's important for all our uh, players to know that the technology exists, how they can profit. I don't know how they can profit. Maybe they can tell me. Maybe my colleagues from tourism can tell me. Uh, I'm here to help people make it happen. Right, brilliant. And let me also ask you a question because Afterwards, what we are going to do is to open the floor, so you are invited to ask your questions. And I know that we have already some questions online, so Hugo is going to, to tell us the questions that have been asked somewhere there. But before we do that, let me ask you, and uh, again, coming back to this point, do you, what kind of demands do you have in the department? I mean, is it mostly a demand coming from manufacturing, from services, from the tourism sector, or what? Or it's not easy to split all these different areas? It's, it's literally impossible. So the, the current trend is that we do not drive the technology. Okay. We let the other verticals drive the technology. Yeah. So it's the cities that ask us for technologies. It's some, the factories that right. ask us for technologies. All right. It's the tourists that ask us for technologies. And we create enablers because technologists, they can develop technology for the sake of technology. But unless it's applied to something, there is no value. There is right. no money to be made of it. So there is no reason to produce that technology. Right. And we require those use cases. Okay, brilliant. So thank you very much. Hugo, are you going to ask the question? Who's going to ask the questions that we have online? And in case you have a question, I can also uh, ask from the audience. Is there any question that will be asked now? Not yet. Oh, please, yeah, yeah. If we don't have from the room, we already have a lot of uh, movements here in the chat. Right. Uh, we have uh, questions uh, from uh, Hatul Sharma from India which I would like to ask about uh, the relationships between uh, religious uh, tourism and uh, tourism, how to separate and how, how is it connected and related to these topics. We also have a question from Kusen Ibrahimov uh, from the University of Alicante, who is asking uh, how to imagine the effect of the climate change on tourism during this digital transformation already, anticipating a bit of what we are also discussing on the next panel. Uh, so maybe we can, uh, we can work with that. Also, uh, a question from uh, Solomon, which asked directly to <laughs> Professor Bohalis about privacy issues regarding that video with the Marriott example. Maybe I think with this, we can uh, uh, start our... OK, brilliant. Dimitris, would you like to start with the last Let's one? Let's start with the privacy one. Yeah. Um, Privacy has always been one of the issues that people are asking for. And I think we are getting into a situation where people are giving up privacy. Uh, and they give up privacy because of the value that they get. I normally ask people if they use Gmail. Who's using Gmail here? All of you do. So you've given up privacy already. And yes, you have. Whether you, whether you like it or not, the minute you have clicked, I like that, you've given up privacy because Gmail is reading and Google is reading what you're, you're receiving. Nobody force you, nobody put a knife or, or a gun to your, to your head and say you need to use this, but actually you did. Uh, I know that all of us will give anything to get Wi-Fi access. Hmm. Has anybody checked the small print when you're saying yes, yes, yes? Give me Wi-Fi access because this is what I need. So um, there are a lot of issues about privacy and it's a real issue, but actually, especially on social media, a lot of people are uploading information and they are telling the world. 
So you cannot have it both ways. You cannot save the world what you like to save the world and save this private information. If you like to keep private information, a lot of information, a lot of what's happening actually on my profile is quite private. You never know what I did with Carlos on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. What you know is what I wanted you to know that ha what happened with Carlos on Saturday. Okay. Um, so and I think I think I think that people are learning how to deal with um, privacy issues by first controlling their actions. But I, I had recently a, a surprise by looking back into Google Maps that knew exactly where I went, which day, how long I stayed, I, I was in Athens with my mom, how long did I stay in each place I visited, and I, f I had forgotten where I had gone on that day, but Google Maps remembered. So privacy is a real issue, but actually, we are dealing with privacy. It's very subjective, and we are learning, we are learning to do that in a different way. I don't know if Stan yeah. would like to... Stan, if you, if you want to pick up one of the questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the questions was about tourism and religion. Yes, it's, uh, it's from an so uh, online viewer from India. Yeah, it's difficult to find the link uh, in our case. Uh, but uh, what I can say is that uh, um, robots can be used also as priests. Uh, practically, they are unlimited <laughs> applications, of course, just for reading. But I would, go, uh, would like to go back to the, uh, to the privacy question. Uh, yeah. Um, if, all information that uh, we create online remains online. Uh, the question is, uh, should we freak out that it, someone is reading the information? I have a more pragmatic view on this and think that, uh, uh, okay, my information is already there, but I'm not so important that someone will spend the time to actually read what is there. So uh, I'm not quite concerned about uh, about all, the, uh, all these things, although uh, uh, it, it's good that we control what is, uh, what is posted uh, online. But in any way, technology is already collect information about yes. us. Let's go back to the religion question. Um, religious tourism is one particular form of specialized tourism. And the biggest event every year is the Hajj where Muslims are going to Mecca for praying for three weeks, mm -hmm. and Umr is the, they're going to Mecca outside the Hajj period. And that's something I really want to study, and I've started with some colleagues in Saudi to actually look at that, because Saudi is opening tourism, and Hajj and religious tourism is one of the biggest things. What technology will do, like any other things, and any other form of tourism, is facilitate that and, and provide particular information for people who are going to religious pilgrimage and all kind of things. A friend of mine recently did the Santiago de Compostela um, route, and, and again, it was a month yeah. worth of walking um, with the religion kind of uh, theme. It's, it's like any theme. Mm -hmm. um, you are creating communities and ecosystems to actually manage that particular activity. And okay, um, religious tourism has got an element of spirituality mm -hmm. and pilgrimage and a lot of other things. But when you're looking from a computer and information systems point of view, it's basically like any other special yeah, yeah. interest tourism where you've got milestones and you've got supporting services that are going there. So, you know, a religious tourist may be going to church, a wine wine-based tourists may be going to wineries, uh, a surfing tourist may be going to the beach to do surfing. It's, it's for us to understand what is the particular needs of each particular sp um, uh, specific form of tourism and creating the ecosystem where things are happening. Um, something in particular on religious tourism, there's now quite a lot of material that's available out there and there are very strong communities that facilitate religious tourism, and, and I think it's, you know, in the past, you know, um, you'll have the church, the physical analog church, um, and the people who go to the church um, 
undertaking uh, religious travel in particular, in particular ways. Now you've got a whole range of other things that like, um, uh, you know, you can watch things online, you can do um, live streaming out of um, the cathedral, you've got a lot of engagement offline, digital and analog coming together to facilitate a whole range of different elements and bring um, the ecosystem together. And there was another one that yes, was... Yes, there's a question regarding uh, the relation or the restrictions of climate change on this uh, transformation. Maybe also revolving when we think about artificial intelligence, it, it computes a lot of data, but it, it also consumes a lot of energy. It might pose a, a, yeah. like a, an obstacle to this uh, evolution that we have foreseen mainly in, in Stanislav presentation. What, what are your thoughts regarding this topic? Um, yeah, if we make the energy balance, if, for example, automation technologies make travel more efficient so that we practically save on fuel there, and uh, it may turn out that they compensate for the additional harm that we create for the environment through the additional uh, calculations that have to, be, uh, have to be made from the data centers. <laughs> Um, this, this is a very false question because in the, in the sense that uh, information technologies are increasingly more green. Mm -hmm. One of the, the greatest uh, technology hypes that we've made was to create green ICT. Mm -hmm. So we have lowered the costs of computation a lot. Of course we increased the number of computations that we do a lot too. But um, I just uh, um, read this last week uh, from Facebook um, engineering team that we've basically reached peak computation. And the problems we address are basically the same and we have more than enough computation for it. I, I would like to go back to, to the privacy issues because I would like to, um, to relate to the proposition made before about big data. Um, we have a very serious issue in Europe and that comes from the GDPR. The GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation that has been passed for EU, it seriously impacts the developments and analysis of big data. And when we talked about merging information from transports and hotels, there are various issues related to GDPR that, un that void us from using really that data the same way our colleagues in the States and Asia do. That, that will have a very important aspect because our colleagues and our competitors in those regions will be able to use that information to propose new packages for tourism, to improve and efficiently use that information, while we in Europe are limited in what we can do to that. Of course, we can say that it is um, Everything that I do is already open. I decided to give it away. But the GDPR was posed because there are serious issues associated with that information. It's fine. I can think that no one wants to harm me. But the information that I make available, unawarely, can be used and tracked in ways that I cannot foresee. And today, I may be, well, I think that I'm doing everything right. Next day I can be persecuted. And that's the, the reason why EU decided to protect the citizens. So we need to really take into consideration the, the value that we get from that big data and collecting that big data and merging that information together against all the um, unforeseen aspects that we are not foreseeing, but some of our competitors have foreseen already. So it, it is very, very special and delicate aspect to, to ensure. I, I would like to also Actually, to... Actually, I mean, if you look at the GDPR, it really requires permission. And what, happen, and, 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 and what happens is that people give permission because they don't read the small print. And the permission is on the small print. But the, the, the GDPR also says that you need to do it as an opt-in and not all the things involve an opt-in. If, if I'm to, if I go in the trip in the door of vision and I need to fill in a, a, 
form. It can be electronic form everywhere. At some point in time, I will stop doing it and I will find my experience less than the intrusive and pervasiveness of what is expected to be a tourist experience. I have at least experienced that. Um, everyone gets bothered by the, the cookie pop-up everywhere. Okay, That's again, it, it's not the GDPR, it's something very basic, even previous to the GDPR issues, but everyone gets bothered. Most of people actually read everything, they don't fill in the pop-up. Of course, you can always say that you only get access if you fill in the pop-up. But people are fighting against it. If you look in, in I don't know the, the case outside, but in Portugal we have a platform called Nonio that collects information when you're reading newspapers. People are fighting against it. They don't want to be tracked. Some important newspapers already left the platform because they were losing viewers, because the viewers were required to opt in that. So it's very delicate, especially because our European culture is quite different from those of the American culture and of the Asian culture. And um, we need to deal with those issues. And, and of course, they don't need to deal with those issues and they will be strong competitors with us. Brilliant. I suppose we have another question yeah, from there and then I know that we have a couple of questions coming from the audience and I'm going to ask the questions afterwards, please. So our last uh, question online from Idem Adzehu. I'm sorry if I have mispronounced it. So he says, most people talk of the African continent as destinations for the future. How can these destinations prepare to receive visitors who want it uh, now to enhance the experience in Africa, African markets? Africa is developing really fast and the population, if you see some of this Stanivas, um, uh, uh, slides the population in in africa is going to grow dramatically by 2050. Um, africa has got major issues um, in terms of resources how the resources are used in terms of peace and how you know safety security and more um, specifically to tourism um, you really need to develop infrastructure and you really need to develop in, uh, transportation. If you want to go from one African country to another, quite often it's more effective to go back to Europe, mainly Paris, and come out to Africa again, because the internal transportation in Africa is quite quite underdeveloped. And but there are a lot of developments right now in with conference and in, and there is the, the first um, tourism African Council getting together to take some of these things forward and to develop Africa for the future. But I think, I think it's really critical for Africans to take ownership of this. I've been in many African countries and quite developed as well where they will tell me that your safety security is actually um, uh, is a, you're under danger to the degree that you cannot, you cannot have your, your hand on, your, on the door of the car. So I think Africans need to take ownership because quite often I'm, I'm, I'm involved a lot with Africa and quite often they say, come and save me. That's what, you know, we have got the right to be saved, which is fine. But I think Africans need to take um, ownership of their own destiny. They need to improve peace, safety, security. They need to engage in conversation with other African countries. They need to develop infrastructure, use resources better, and gradually they need to develop transportation between African countries. And the product, the African product, is amazing. It's authentic, it's fantastic. And, you know, there's the nature that's phenomenal, the, the cultures that are phenomenal, they are very authentic because quite often they are not very mixed with a lot, a lot of other places. So, as a destination, it's fantastic, but they need to to sort out the infrastructural things and the peace and the sec safety security. Yeah, l let me ask uh, Stan to come also to, to this point because your views about, uh, for instance, of course that I'm not going to, to mm -hmm. place this on um, too 
opposite extremes, I would say. But um, when you are talking about robots, mm -hmm. you are addressing this, namely in terms of the world's population. And as you, as you have said, I mean, we have problems in Europe and in many other countries, even in Japan, Portugal as well. And, but when it comes to Africa, of course, you do not have a problem with the population. Of course, that the question about robots is mostly about demographics, or how, how do you see this? I mean, would you please expand on this? Yeah. Um, the pro well, companies are, will be forced to use automation technologies and robotics in particular because of the lack of sufficient employees on the market. This will be, this will be the case. So uh, they will be widely used in uh, Europe, Far East, yeah. US. So countries where you have uh, increasing population, there's no economic justification to use robots because it, 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 it will be much better to use uh, uh, human labor. This is first from economic point of view. But also it is not necessary for every, uh, for every company to use automation technologies. They need to consider, for example, what is their positioning. I would expect, for example, the use of uh, high-tech automation technologies, let's say in the Far East or in Europe in the US, but uh, African destinations, for example, they can create a completely different experience, which is high touch rather than high tech. And uh, they will be com more competitive on the market with such experiences rather than with automated experiences. All right. So Good. it's not necessary okay. to use. That's why technology is a tool, it's not a goal. Of course, that I was pushing you know, the yeah. conversation, the debate towards Africa because yeah. the, the question was coming from Africa. So let's ask the audience if you have questions. Can we take one, two, three questions in a row? Please, Mariana. Hello, my name is Mariana and my question is for Professor Stanislav. Do you think that the economic aspect of the guests affects the likeliness to accept Razor? For example, would a five-star hotel be more likely to adopt Razor as a preference of the guests than a hostel, for example? Yes. Uh, thank you. This is a wonderful question, and it uh, goes back to the, to the microeconomic fundamentals of uh, Razor Technologies. Uh, the adoption from the supply side depends on the category and the size, practically on the possible econ economies of scale. If you have a five-star hotel with 5,000 rooms in Las Vegas, you can easily have 100 robots for room service delivery, uh, as concierges, for entertainment, for as uh, waiters, uh, for creating experiences. If you have a hostel with 10 rooms, then it's absolutely no economic reason to use uh, uh, rob robotic technologies. Practically, it will be so expensive that you can never uh, uh, recoup your investment from uh, such uh, in such technologies. So practically, yes, you need larger size and you need higher category uh, in order to uh, compensate for this. Uh, but of course, this is not, uh, this is when we talk about robots. But when we uh, talk about kiosks and uh, other technologies, then it's possible to have it also at uh, lower category. For example, in Varna, uh, we have one hostel with 20 something rooms, which is completely automated. And if I remember well, the price is something within the range of 20, 25 euros per night. So it's also possible, but they don't have robots there. They, they, they have a kiosk as a receptionist. Okay, brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Second question, Ivana. Hello, good morning. Uh, I have a question for Professor Diogo, uh, particularly about what you mentioned that you're working at the moment on 6G. So I'm curious to know, and I think a lot of people also don't know the differences between 4G, 5G, 6G. So could you enlighten us a little bit on that aspect, please? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, that's a question that puts us a, a little bit far from the topic of this, of this meeting. Um, since, since we started working in 3G, and that was a long time ago, um, each generation is an increment from the previous one. And that relates to my initial statement that we can do it for the sake of technology and of increasing speed, increasing range, increasing energy efficiency. But most importantly, and we started to pick up 
at the end of 4G and, and 5G was mostly about it, is about applying that technology to real use cases and applying it to smart cities, smart factories. These have been the, the most important use cases for, for 5G. Uh, we're now starting to discuss the, the enabling uh, use cases of 6G. Uh, most probably it will be about sustainability, it will be about new important um, use cases for our current society. Uh, maybe we can uh, push tourism to be <laughs> one such use case uh, for, for the future. But it's, um, of course, we will have more speed, we'll have more increased uh, radio. We, we always have more technology per se. But um, the use cases are increasingly more important for the economic sustainability. Um, I'm, I'm going way out of the topic, but into the economic aspect. One, one thing that which is very interesting, and we had last week here um, a talk about 5G, and we also talked about what's coming on 6G, is that most telecom operators have not deployed 4G yet. And you ask yourselves, hmm, how is that possible? Now, the, the thing is that the cost of deploying a new network is very high. The return on investment is low. So you really need to have a very good use case. Therefore, we need to come up with uh, these use cases that strengthen why should we do it. Because as technologists, we, we just develop the technology. But someone needs to make an economic use case of it. And uh, as we go into 5G, what most certainly will happen is that many people will just skip. And we're talking about Africa and the lack of infrastructures in Africa. Africa will probably jump two generations. Yeah. They, they will just skip it because tourists are going there and they want to use social media. They want to stream. They want to do a lot of things. Technology is not there and we will need to give them that technology so that the tourists that go there can actually have the experience they expect. But the Africa has missed the, the cable revolution and it's actually much cheaper now to go to the 5G because they haven't got the infrastructure, they, they don't have to dig the roads effectively. Exactly, and, and it's one of the leading aspects of 5G. One, one of the things that 5G did was to create a, a high bandwidth back hole, exactly, because we see those targets and we see the need to, where 4G was not able to be put in, we developed the technology to fill in the gaps. Um, I, I was in Africa this summer uh, in, um, in a summer school and I could see there that uh, people want to use it, they don't have the technology to use it. I, as um, a tourist, despite doing my summer school, I was also a tourist. I could not have the services I was expected. We get the custom, it was the Wi-Fi, where's the Wi-Fi? I was not looking for Wi-Fi, I was just looking for 3G, okay? <laughs> I, was, I was fine if I could get 3G. So. Technology needs to get there so that your experience is the, the expected one. Automation-wise, I, I find that something that was very strange to me, but they have a lot of population. But it, it, make, it confused me a lot that people working in the service, so at a restaurant or a receptionist, they do not have enough education to serve you properly. Um, I, I was scared because that will temper their development. And I don't know if technology can help them fill in that void. But there is, there is a void about education that might require some, edu some uh, well, the education was, robots. The, or the demand was not there. That's why there's no education. Now that the demand is going fast, the education is going to come as well. So it's, I, I think Africa is going to... Uh, what the jump, jump frog, is it leapfrogging or frog, yeah, F leap, uh, leap, leap forward. So, so and it's going to go forward missing a lot of the stuff that we had to go through and go to the next generation and be very, very cost effective on how they'll do things. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, let's take two more questions and then we will stop this session. 
Hi, my name is Augusto. I'm a tourism PhD student here at the university. Uh, my question is a little bit provocative, so don't take it wrong. Um, you are all professors, and I would like to hear from you. How are you addressing this, I these issues on your classroom? And do you think that you can be replaced by a robot in the future? <laughs> Very good one. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I'm a robot. He's one of my PhD students. Okay. <laughs> In fact, in fact, I'm a robot, Professor Bukhalis is on holiday somewhere, on a nice Greek island. <laughs> well, uh, three years ago I wrote an article which is uh, titled, Will Robots Substitute Teachers? And the abstract contains only three letters. Yes. <laughs> That's it. I think uh, you, can, you can Google the article and you can read. The, art, uh, the abstract is really one word. Only. Well, the, the only thing that robots do not have currently is empathy. Mm -hmm. But machine learning is going to teach them empathy. Mm -hmm. And they will be... I just want to believe that they're not going to be innovative and they're not going to be creative enough to actually take things forward. Having said that, if you see a lot of the creativity is coming out of data and analysis of patterns, which they'll be they'll be fantastically better than us because they'll be much quicker, they'll operate in different algorithms. Um, but I think that empathetic kind of thing, the fact that when I see someone, I understand a lot of the things that, uh, for this person, that a robot will take awfully a lot of time to understand. And the other, the other thing is that um, the feedback process uh, when I design a tourism product, I'll suggest something based on my experience to someone who's in front of me based on what I understand that they will need. But then I'll be very switched on to pick up signals back to see if that actually fits on this context in that particular time in now or not. Uh, a tourist, you know, I was staying in a hotel last night. The tourist who is going there for a conference is a very different tourist. We stay in the same room on a leisure kind of thing. And it takes a split second to make decisions and to say, do this or do that. And I think, I think empathy is something that hopefully robots and, and innovation creativity that robots are not going to create and thinking out of the box because by definition, a robot is doing what a programmer has told it to do. And then it's improving by machine learning, getting more information about these things, and react to a situation based on what happened and the feedback of that. So it will say, yes, I gave you a, a, a bottle of Duro uh, wine, and the feedback I got was better. But I will have that, impact, uh, that feedback instantly. So my machine learning is faster than the robot, and especially as far as emotion is concerned. I would like to go back to the second part of the question, how we address this uh, in our class, in the classroom. Um, in, uh, in my classes, I, I have few lectures on, on this, so it's not a whole uh, program, it's not a whole subject, a whole module, uh, but in the next semester, from February, we are starting a whole module with 45 contact hours, which is uh, technologies in travel and, and uh, tourism, where all these issues, including the, uh, including the social impacts, the ethical aspects of uh, robotics, which uh, they will be discussed in uh, greater details. It was a very good question and excellent answers, as you can see. So let's move on for the last question. Who's going to ask the last question? Mariana, for the second time. <laughs> She's also working. She's doing a thesis on robot. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi again. So my question now is again for Professor Stanislav okay. and also for Professor Diogo. Do you think that considering the problems that tourism is facing right now, let's for example with data security, with terrorism, do you think that the robotic laws are up to date? <laughs> There are many issues that are not uh, included as laws for the moment, but yeah, it's a completely, uh, it's a very long topic, which we can discuss later and probably write something together. <laughs> um, 
first off, loss and uh, getting back to to the subject of how things are done in the West and the East, and they're very different. The approaches are, are, are very different. The constraints are very different. And um, nonetheless, we're dealing with uh, a global economy. Uh, and that creates difficulties or easiness for some researchers somewhere, some economies somewhere. Um, we will need to deal with this worldwide, sooner or later. This is very important. So think, I, I think that um, WTO or some economic organization will have to deal with those so that they level the field up for everyone. For instance, in the West, uh, in, uh, in California, as far west as we can go, they are adopting similar rules for privacy as those that we have in, in Europe. That's a very important trend for the United States, which typically do not have those constraints. California adopting such uh, privacy rules are very important as a leading um, towards normalization of, of European rules applied to American people, American people following the same rules uh, as European people. The East, they have a different opinion on, on, on privacy, and we are all aware of it. You just go to China and they track you from the, the moment you step out of the plane until you get back into the plane, they know where you've been all the time, not necessarily for tourist reasons. And they, they see it as a requirement and a safety for, for the country. We don't do that stuff here. We're forbidden from doing that stuff. And that will always take us to, to different paths because uh, Chinese equipments get to Europe, they get to states, and they are doing the same thing. Uh, they, they don't follow borders. They, they do follow the, the rules of the manufacturer. So um, it's, it's very interesting things that um, we need to foresee for the future. And it, everything is bright in the future, as always. But we need to be on our toes, making sure that there are no clouds beyond those used for computation in the near future. OK. Thank you very much. We are going to stop now. And uh, we are going to have a break until 11.25. And we'll come back at 11.25. Uh, Before we leave, let me thank on behalf of the department and the University of Aveil, Professor Dimitris Bohali, Professor Stanislav Ivanov and Professor Diogo Gomes. It has been a pleasure. I suppose that the audience has also enjoyed this session, and which means that sooner or later we'll repeat, you know, something like this, eventually in a different format, but we'll come back to this relationship between tourism, technology, and digital trends. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So I will please ask you to get back to, to your seats, please. We will be <coughs> we'll be returning to the session. Up until now, we have been talking more about the future trends regarding technologies and digital and digital solutions. But now we're going to have a, a new focus which is on another trend, which is less from the, the supply side, more from the demand side, uh, regarding sustainability issues and the circular economy, which is actually a new vision of the, of the economic system and uh, how this will also entail in the, in the tourism sector. Uh, for this, we'll have a, a few uh, presentations from our international speakers. We'll start with uh, Cynthia de Marsa, which um, is a former second national expert, which worked with the European Commission, Before. have worked with uh, the Council of Europe. Yes. In the, also collaboration with the UNWTO. And, uh, and also in the European uh, Tourism Indicator System, yes. right? Yes, which that is was a, my file, my dossier, yes. And uh, she, she will be starting uh, with the first presentation. Exactly. <coughs> so, you. I start too, too soon. Okay, I will show. Um, let me say how can... Uh... Yeah, so you, you just have to... Okay. Downwards. So, first of all, Good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? Because, yeah, this microphone, it's not always uh, 
very well positioned. So uh, as uh, Hugo said, uh, my name is Cinzia De Marzo. Uh, my professional profile is lawyer, specialized in European Union law, but my passion is uh, to be an expert, a sustainable tourism expert since many, many years. So I work more in the field of tourism uh, and I've been working in the Commission, responsible at that time for five years of the European Tourism Indicator System, which is a very interesting tool for the destinations. And I remember many, many destinations, they were excited to collaborate with the Commission at that time, between 2012 and 2016, because without measuring, without having uh, information and data at the local level, you cannot manage. You cannot, uh, let's say, make a good strategies for your destination, especially regarding the uh, impact uh, of tourism, uh, especially regarding the impact of environmental, social, economic, also, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, mm, management part of this, of this uh, economy, uh, economy that is also uh, growing from the destination. In my presentation, I would like to uh, focus more uh, in a very important strategy, which is the circular economy at European level in the context of sustainable tourism. Why? Uh, because uh, since 2015, the European Union is more uh, interesting in this, uh, as a priority, in this uh, new vision of the uh, economy at European level in the way of circular, in the way of uh, using uh, recycling, using attention for uh, the um, uh, wasting management for the water consumption, for the energy consumption. So all these uh, priorities has to be also linked with the sectors. In particular, regarding tourism, not many uh, so far, let's say, not many policies has been related to the connection between circular economy and tourism. I would like to show you this. I would like to start from the as a lawyer, I'm sorry because this is my mentality. I would like to start with the EU policy framework because as usual, we have to understand where we are, what, where we are starting from. And uh, as an expert on tourism, when I had many experiences with the local managers, with the uh, tourist SMEs, they don't know, many of them, from how to start. They don't know how to align their uh, activities uh, in which framework they have to be considered. So that's why it's very important, that's my opinion uh, as a lawyer, but also be, as an expert, to be aware about the uh, condition, the framework condition that we have, uh, especially if there are commitment at the European level, if there are public uh, official documents, if there are recommendation and principle that you, you might, we might know, especially if you want to work in the field of tourism. So in this case, EU circular economy, many, many people maybe have, be, uh, have feared about a circular economy, but from where we have to start? We start from the strategy developed in 2015 by the European Commission. There is a communication behind, that's the starting point. Communication 2015, number 64. Those are public documents. Everybody can look at these documents, not just the lawyers. So, uh, and the, what the topic of this strategy was, as you can see, closing the loop, a new action plan for circular economy. It's not just a, a theoric document. Within this strategy, it's been foreseen as a, an action plan, action to be taken from whom, from, from what kind of uh, target, public and private, and private target. In this case, this is just to let you know what is, in summary, uh, included in the action plan. <laughs> legislative proposals, when we think about legislative proposals, we think about uh, mandatory uh, action that the member states have to take. That's uh, related to the competencies of the European Union. So legislative proposals, it's possible in some sector, in the, in the case of water reducing landfilling and in the case of recycling and reuse. Uh, then the Commission remains fully committed to integrate 
the circular economy principles across different policies areas. That's why I would like to show you to what extent tourism is included in these policy areas. Uh, in the action plan, uh, in particular, the main actions are related to the production uh, and the consumption, repair, manufacturing, waste management, and secondary raw materials. Then, just to see, uh, related to tourism, as I said, what are uh, the main uh, aspects of tourism that we can uh, link with the circular economy approach? The circular economy approach means to focus on the uh, consumption, the production, in the way of reducing the impact, in the way of recycling, in the way of reusing uh, the same material for different uh, purposes. Well, you can see food, food waste, and tourist establishment and restaurants. That's the main uh, <laughs> impact that uh, is linked from the... Um, uh, tourist sector uh, with the circular economy uh, action plan and strategy. <coughs> Restaurants, in particular, are the second largest source of food waste after household and hospitality service. So that's why. And what are generating? Are generating up to 20% of total food waste per year. So that's why we should be aware about the impact that is generating the tourism sector, particularly the restaurants and the hospitality services, in this uh, framework of the circular economy strategy. And to be aware that uh, if we want to maybe to uh, receive from the point of view of, uh, let, let's think about the private sector, always the private sector, the enterprises, they are always looking for money. They want to see the benefits. So in, as much as the action are related to the strategies and the policy recommendation at European level, that's better for them to get the benefits because they can get maybe incentives from the public sector because the public sector has to full, fully be committed for this uh, action related to the policy uh, official documents. Then. I would like to add you another important uh, point. Not only we have to consider this uh, policy framework with an holistic approach. Why holistic? Uh, we have to see what is on the left side, but as well the right side together, not separated. European level has to be also related with the international level. That's why when we think about the commitment, the engagement from the EU institutions' point of view, they are also in line with the international guidelines foreseen in what? In, to, in the agenda 2030 of the United Nations, the 17 goals, the 17 sustainable development goals. If I ask you to, uh, all of you, if you know what are the 17 uh, sustainable develop development goals, maybe not all of you are aware about what they are about, what are the topics related to the 17. In our case, let's stop in goal 12 and 15, <laughs> because we have to be as much as possible to streamline and to be um, also uh, really, really uh, close to the point. Why 12, why 15? 12, because the topic of 12 is responsible and sustainable consumption. We were talking about the strategy circular economy and what is about is about the, all the value chain from the production to the consumption. So that's why we have to be aware about the responsible and consumption and, and, and the responsible and the sustainable consumption and production. 12.7 in particular, is related to the sustainability, uh, to the reducing of the waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. So there are complementarities between the goal 12, target 12.7 uh, of the SDG, the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, and the circular economy strategy, the action plan that we were saying before. Why the 15? Because the 15 is related to sustainable tourists that can play a major role owing the, its effort towards the reduction of waste and consumption and its awareness raising activities. So 15 and 12 are the most close to sustainable tourism and to the uh, consumption and, and production. 
And uh, just to let you know what are the steps further that the European Union is following after 2015, see, this is uh, the, the second step. 2016, uh, the, the European Commission uh, established a common methodology, European methodology, to measure food waste and food losses uh, and losses and food waste bringing together member states and all actors in the food value chain. And that's, oh, sorry, uh, no, I'm going, yeah, uh, that's the, the second one, no, because, sorry, because I don't, know. yeah. That's what happened after the uh, approval of the strategy in 2015. One year later, as I told you before, I was the responsible ATIS. ATIS is the European Tourism Indicator System. Indicators are criteria, criteria that help uh, all the, uh, let's say, responsible stakeholders, public sector in particular, to measure, to monitor, to get the data, to collect, to gather information, indicators, criteria. So we need to think about this. Uh, in the same way, the European Commission was thinking in the circular economy strategy about the need to develop indicators, a framework of indicators. That's why they set up 10 key indicators, uh, meaningful indi indicators, uh, um, specified in four, in four uh, stages, uh, in order to measure also the circular economy impact through the different sectors. Those are the four uh, main areas production and consumption, waste management, secondary raw materials, competitiveness and innovation. And uh, all these now, these indicators are uh, under implementation uh, because the process started in 2016. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is the improvement of this framework in 2018. I, I, like, to, uh, uh, I, li I like to highlight the contemporary uh, process that you can see 2015, 2016, 2018. We are not talking about 20 years ago. We are talking about something very new. And that's important for all of us to, to be aware about the contemporary uh, process of this uh, policy, uh, dynamic policy uh, framework, because we can be involved. Because it's not something related to the key players, it's related to all of us. We can be aware, we can learn about, we can use it. That's, that's my opinion and that can empower our action, daily action. So in the case of the secret economy monitoring framework, just to give you an idea, that's the indicators. I don't want to go into details, but just to know, let you know that there are those indicators in order to be more focused on the uh, um, uh, calculation of the impact of, of the different sector related to the four macro area like uh, consumption or raw materials or innovation and competitiveness, as you say, see. Uh, innovation competitiveness, you were talking in the panel before, I, I, I missed unfortunately because I just arrived from Brussels this morning. But then, so then let's see, um, let's, no. I'm sorry because I'm not very, let's see another point. So far we were looking at the circular economy strategy in particular and we understand that there are link and synergies also with the, the tourism sector. But as I said before, holistic approach means also looking at the complementarities between different policy frameworks, different uh, uh, recommendations in place which are somehow complementary. This is the case. Uh, I made a selection because as an expert, let me say that uh, at least I can do in uh, one day what other people need to do in one month because I have this knowledge in my head, in my bag, in my shoulder, small shoulder, but there is a knowledge there. So that's why I can make this selection. And uh, you see, again, I like to, to show you this uh, chronology between the time. So 2015, even the agenda of the United Nations, the 17 Sustainable Develop Development Goals, uh, and uh, the, particularly the 12 and 15 we, we saw before, it, it was being approved in 2015, the same year of the UC Core Economy Package. So same time. 
Last two days ago, three days ago in Brussels, the new commissioner uh, approved the uh, new Green Deal for, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the next tw seven years in, in front of us, 21-27. Uh, 2021, 2027, and, and on the top of this new Green Deal, European New Green Deal, what is written there? I had a look, circular economy, digital agenda, sustainability, sustainable development, and climate action. Those are the, just to, 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 to summarize, the main, the main pillar for the new uh, period. It's not the new, it's the current period because it already started. But that's just to let you know that circular economy is there. And, and then the alignment to the agenda 2030 of the United Nations, which is becoming an umbrella, an umbrella for all of the action at European level. So 2015, same time of the strategy, the circular economy. Then 2016, there is another communication Communication, just very under bracket, is not a binding document. It's a very uh, soft document from the, co the Commission. Uh, indeed, there is no legislative uh, power behind it. It's a, it's a soft document. But at least there are content and principles there. So in this case, this communication is very important. A next steps for a, a sustainable European future. You see sustainability is always there. Then in 2018, another important communication, it was December, just few, last year, exactly December one year ago, another communication, clean planet for all. As I told you, climate change is also there, climate action. So, and then this year, 2019 in January, another document, a, a European reflection paper towards a sustainable Europe by 2030. You see how many links, how many complementarities there are. But we are talking about different documents, different sources, and different also uh, policies, policy, policy areas, let's say. So I will go a little bit faster because otherwise it will be too... too. In this case, I have uh, for each uh, mention of the document, I have a content here. You see, this is a communication 2016, and just to see the key actions, just to, to, to show you the complementarities at the end, you see key actions and governance elements, they are in line with the SDG implementation. So in this communication of the European Commission, European Union, European Action for Sustainability. What is the commitment? The commitment is to become a front runner and implementing the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. See, this is just to let you know that we are, they are fully in line. Then uh, I go a little bit uh, further. Those are the 17 goals. And the 12 is there, see? The responsible consumption and production. And the 15 is here, about the water. So then, the 2018 communication, a clean planet for all, another European strategic long-term vision, because that's the way we have to look further. We have to have a strategic vision, long-term vision, for a prosperous, modern, competitive, and climate natural economy. Unfortunately, COP25 was very, it failed. I, I read an article this morning on Financial Times, unfortunately, in Madrid last week. But then, at least there is, a commitment, and uh, you can see uh, that uh, what is needed also, and uh, that's about us, uh, behavioral changes by individuals and companies. We must be part of this loop, not say this is a responsibility of our governance, uh, governments or, 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 or the industry. No, it's also our. So behavioral changes by individuals and companies must, un must underpin this evolution. We must be included. So just to, to, to see also the importance of uh, production industrial for the, for the plastic, for the reducing the plastic, increasing the recycling rates. So this is something that we have to take into account. Very important. Then I'm almost finished. Uh, the reflection paper, uh, that I, the, the recent one in 2000 has been approved in 2019. As you can see, from linear to circular economy, so we have to change the paradigm. We have to switch into this new paradigm. That's why uh, it's very, very important to, uh, to, to be uh, in, uh, committed and to be in line with all these 
priorities. So creating socially and environmentally responsible business, corporate social responsibility, those are the, uh, should be our Bible, let's say, for the next uh, uh, implementation phase for what, what we do in, in the tourism sector. Then, uh, I would like to finish with some examples because we are now starting from the theory framework, theoretical framework in the principles and guidelines, and to see uh, at the end what are the concrete examples in place. In this case, uh, this, uh, those are the uh, results from a study report made by Eurochamp. Eurochamp is the organization of the of the, all the chambers of commerce at, Euro, at European level. They made a, a study report on the circular economy uh, in, in different sectors. Uh, about tourism, they found that, uh, in, uh, first of all, they found that the circular economy uh, uh, has an impact in particular in the waste management, uh, recycling, and also in the um, um, raw materials, and hospitality and food, see, in the hospitality and food service sector the opportunity in achieving higher resource efficiency would cost an estimated billion in total and offer net benefits for 27,500 billion company or 10% of an average turnover. So what is important to see is that hospitality and food service can employ many people. There are an increasing number of people and enterprises engaged, but uh, in the case of the, sorry, in the case of the benefits, that's as the example now. Ah, oh my God. <laughs> ah, sorry, because now I'm in Ari. Uh, that's, no, no, the next one, the next one. That's the report, yeah, the benefits. In the report has been highlighted that there are the benefits for these uh, enterprises committed for the transition to take into account the transition phase. And you see the transition to a circular economy, including to a circular bioeconomy, is a huge opportunity to create competitive advantages on a sustainable basis. So we must really think about the benefits and not the binding issues or things that they have to limit the, the, the activity of the tourist enterprises. Applying the circular economy principles in all sectors and industries will benefit Europe environmentally and socially. That's what we have to think about. And those are uh, uh, data coming from the report analysis made by Eurochamp this year, into, published in 2019. So, just to let you know, the transition to a circular economy helped the EU to decrease environmental, social, and economic pressures uh, globally and increase the EU strategic autonomy. That's not what we should uh, all, always uh, uh, reflect in our activity. Then, the next, uh, it's all. and then the examples, two examples. One come from Belgium, from Brussels, let's say Belgium, and the other one come from uh, Finland. Uh, I, I personally know the, the example from Finland, but let's start with this one. This is an hotel, hotel chain and they are implementing the circular economy principles. Uh, Martin's Hotel, they have a vision for circular hospitality from theoretical approach, see, the one that we were explaining in the, in the framework or the policy framework, to a concrete approach. Here, what do they do? Martin Hotels is a hospitality service based in Belgium with hotels located through the countries. Martin's applies the circular economy model to its purchasing, waste, and during the renovations it undertakes at various sites. The company has created a sustainable purchasing charter. So when they have to buy things, they have a sustainable charter. It means that they follow uh, the same uh, model for all the uh, um, purchasing that they have to do. Policy that implies the need to take environmental performance at, and cost into, into account through the life cycle of the goods and services. And then also they also have this, uh, Martins introduced also the supplier code of conduct. That's something that can change the daily basis activity from the point of view of the workers, from the point of view of the uh, um, uh, supply uh, services. So they, you see, they can influence also external stakeholders to increase the environmental standards. So that's just, and then, and then just a list of activities that they do in the hotel. 
to let you know concrete. So what do they do? Because otherwise it seems that, okay, they follow the circular economy implementation, but what they do in reality, they do this. They give preference to local natural recycled, recycled and seasonal products, for example. It's not difficult just to do it. Then they encourage suppliers to, 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 to follow, to, to implement the code of conduct. Minimize the flow of incoming waste and recycle. They work exclusively with authorized suppliers in three regions, exclusively. So they made a, they made a selection. They want to find just the authorized suppliers uh, and comply 100% with the technical legal requirements in terms of safety, compliance, and maintenance of technical equipment. So they have this big commitment and they are coherent. They do on a daily basis this activity and therefore they are implementing the circular economy strategy in very, very, let's say, full, uh, full uh, uh, percentage. And they also they see the choice providers with strong environmental policies uh, they purchase 100% uh, of green electricity. So that's just a list of activities. The last example, uh, they are based in uh, Finland. I know the owner of this company is a very creative chef. Uh, he's uh, traveling around the world. He said, I feel guilt because I have to pollute the area because I have to I make a pollution because I have to travel by plane. But I have no choice because he's invited across the world to, to explain uh, his experience, his, his innovative experience. What they do, they, 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 they cook food, but they also they use all the products that they use in, in, the, in the production or in the, in the, when they make the food. See, they, they use all these uh, um, uh, principles. They uh, use waste energy loss, uh, the nutrition and carbon dioxide area for, uh, for the energy and food production. They use plants in the greenhouse benefits from the nutrition water from fish farming. So they are specialized in fish. It's a restaurant based in fish. But they, when they, they cook the fish, that's just the last part of the process. They have uh, the production when this, this, that's, the, 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 that's the company, CBMAR. They have these uh, technologies in place to, uh, um, to follow all the, the, the process of the, when the fish has, been, has, to be, has to be prepared and then to, to go to the table. So that's, that's, a, that's a circular approach. It's a very circular approach. So from the beginning of the, of the uh, production till the, the, the end of, of the use of the food, when you eat it. So that's just to explain that there are some examples, there are some good examples. Maybe we should increase, yes, we should increase it, and that's, uh, and that's the end, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this. And also maybe, maybe you can, so you can watch also the, the next presentation. I would like to call Stefan Lasic. He's, he comes from Italy. He is the co-founder of Echoes of His Journey, which is an a project revolving rural tourism and communities evolving towards sustainable tourism. I'll, I'll give this, wait, wait just a minute, please. And uh, he also is working with a project with the University of Bologna. I, just wait a second, please, because I yes. have to change. Hello everyone, so after Cinzia made this introduction about European environment uh, and the policies on European level, I will focus briefly on challenges and best practices in community-based and rural tourism development. Uh, concretely, I will speak about best practices which were found around Latin American countries during development of Echoes of the Journey project. Of course, these challenges or uh, best practices are not related exclusively to Latin American countries. Contrary, they can be applied in many different uh, en environments, uh, regions, or countries in the world. I will just briefly uh, describe our project and then move on to the results. So Echoes of the Journey was uh, uh, established as an idea to contribute proactively to the development of, a, let's say, more equal or more responsible uh, tourism, or put it simply, the one which benefits local community, uh, their culture, and at the same time protecting or uh, pr preserving the, the nature. Uh, with the idea to uh, understand at which point is sustainable development of tourism in Latin America, we decided to go on a journey which in the end lasted 
15 months by, um, by visiting 10 countries and working in total with more than 40 initiatives uh, in uh, sustainable development of tourism. Those initiatives were from broad uh, areas of tourism, namely hotels, uh, ecologies, non-profit organizations, uh, cooperatives of community-based tourism, uh, private nature reserves, one solution which I still haven't found in, in Europe, uh, for example, but as well academic sector and, and, and private businesses. Of course, uh, while we were helping them in our areas of expertise, at the same time, we were trying to learn from them, from their experience, and how they managed to adapt su sustainable policies in their in environment. Although uh, these were areas of work in which we were focusing with them, in particular sustainability assessment and the application of best practices in tourism development, but during the project we realized that many of these initiatives actually lack uh, um, more quantity or my, more diverse experiences which they can offer to tourists. So uh, uh, product development and uh, capacity building on distribution or co communication became highly important topics during uh, project uh, development. These are some organizations we started to before our journey and during uh, these projects, some of them are known such as GSTC or STI or Green Destination, but many of them as well as I mentioned were uh, local organization or private uh, businesses. Uh, project was started in Argentina uh, and once we have reached the far south, we have started to go up north until we have reached Mexico, where, where we have spent the last five months uh, working with, with Mayan uh, communities, which I will uh, describe a bit later. So, uh, it's probably the, one of the most important outcomes of, of this uh, project were the, the challenges we found in uh, sustainable development of uh, tourism in Latin America. Uh, these challenges were not related to one country particularly, as I mentioned, or one region, and we realized that actually many businesses or many organizations are sharing these challenges. I divided them here in uh, those which are present in the environment of this organization and those which are present inside their own organization. For example, access to funding opportunities and access to new technologies are quite related to public policies and can be solved with efficient co uh, collaboration between public and private sector. Many organizations are not aware of funding opportunities they have or funds are completely excluded from uh, uh, regional uh, policies and, and, and uh, development plans. So simply, there are not sufficient funds to support these businesses. On the other hand, there is a top-down approach as a quite common uh, challenge. Uh, many international uh, organizations or foundations are uh, developing different kind of projects in these countries, but once the funds are over or the project ends, communities or local businesses are not uh, inspired to continue working and simply abandon this project. And it is something which is present in, in a variety of countries, unfortunately. On the other hand, inside these um, organizations, we found a lack of coordination between different stakeholders and lack of delegation of responsibilities. It shows us that there is a still uh, undeveloped communication between people involved in the same project or uh, delegation of uh, different areas uh, of work. It as well comes partially from another challenge we see formal education and vo vocational training because many of, of those people who de uh, decide to dedicate to this project do not have uh, formal education in tourism, in economics or or, or, or administration, or simply it is not available in these rural areas. And because of that, quite uh, a few issues can, can appear in their activities. <clears throat> and as well, wrong image of, of community-based tourism. As you see, I put these three, three challenges in the between, which come partially from environment and partially from them inside. So, as you might know, uh, community-based tourism has this image that it is low quality, that the, uh, that the service is not on a high level as it should be, or that it is uh, uncomfortable. It comes partially from the expectations 
that travelers have from community-based tourism, but as well from uh, communication or uh, the wrong communication uh, coming from the businesses themselves who uh, do not explain very well be, uh, the activities they do or ideas they have be, uh, behind this project. In order to surpass these challenges or to, uh, to actually uh, apply sustainability in tourism, development, uh, it is crucial to apply uh, practices in all three pillars of sustainable development, namely socio-cultural, economic, and uh, environmental. If we lack any of these areas, the, the final outcome or the final goal will not be uh, achieved. Furthermore, uh, by having uh, practices in, in, uh, in the environmental pillar, we can, uh, we can uh, achieve a regenerative role of tourism, which is next step from uh, su sustainability. And as well as Cinzia mentioned in one part, some solutions or some ideas need to be and can be applied in, in national or transnational policies and laws in order to incentivize businesses to apply them or uh, to motivate people to actually change the kind of development there. Uh, they are doing. Some of this we have found in Costa Rica, Colombia and, uh, Colombia and Peru. I will now go briefly through several uh, examples which uh, show us uh, all the positive sides of uh, application of best practices and show us what can we apply in, in local activities. First example comes from Costa Rica and it is Finca Exotica Eco Lodge. This lodge was started on a previous cattle ranch which was first reforested and then 95% of land was protected. So only 5% of land is actually used for tourism where they have their uh, accommodation, network of, of trails, organic garden, etc. They are located on Osa Peninsula. It is the most remote part of Costa Rica. I don't know if you've heard of this information, but almost 2.5% of total biodiversity in the world is located in this peninsula. So uh, legislation quite strong in this area with regards to architecture, construction, etc. In order to be independent from any outside source, uh, ecology is functioning 100% on a renewable energy, being from solar panels and from water turbines from two local uh, rivers. Uh, with their successful uh, protection of land, they as well collaborated with uh, other six uh, uh, properties in their neighborhood to create a wildlife refuge and biological corridor for all fauna which lives in nearby uh, um, Corcovado National Park. It enables many positive aspects for environment itself, but at the same time for flora and, and and found. They are applying completely biodegradable architecture. Uh, they are using uh, organic garden, organic uh, compost, and all other typical uh, uh, practices such as the use of plastics or single-use products. Second example comes from Colombia, and private nature reserve Zafra is quite a particular example. Why? They are developed in a in a region which was heavily hit by armed conflict in the past between drug cartels and, and guerrillas. It was a region which was completely destroyed in, from decades of, 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 of war. And in order to create social, economic, and cultural development or renaissance of this region, Zafra uh, collaborated with, uh, with other stakeholders in order to establish tourism activity to start actually to move region into, into, into some positive development. Uh, in the end, this local uh, network grew to 200 uh, people uh, connecting not only tourism pro providers, but accommodation, coffee uh, uh, growers, uh, cacao providers, restaurant owners, creating cross-sectoral collaboration and holistic growth. As a result, we have received spillover effect of, of tourism, inspiring education, uh, agroforestry, permaculture, uh, and many other uh, areas started to be developed thanks to, uh, to, uh, to tourism. They are as well using a series of, of best uh, practices with regards to environment or use of materials, one of which being, for example, dry toilets, which is quite interesting solution for decreasing use of, of water and creating organic compost at the, at the same time. Uh, from Ecuador comes Uasquila Ecolodge, which is located in the Amazon Basin. Similarly to 
to Finca Exotica. Their land was dedicated to cattle, uh, as a cattle farm was developed for, uh, for decades. When they bought this, this land almost 15 years ago, it was completely deforested. And when they started with the project of reforestation, a local indigenous community recognized the importance of reforestation and get completely involved in that. In less than 10 years, they managed to reforest 200 hectares of, of, of land, which is now completely integrated into Amazon Basin. When tourism started to be developed and to gain more, more popularity, in, uh, indigenous community as well uh, decided to enter this, this project. So they received vocational training courses. They, they now work as tour guides. They, they work in the kitchen, uh, offer services. But not only that, they as well developed their own tourism project and started to receive visitors in their own village. So thanks to that, today over 100 people are benefiting from tourism. They can present their, their culture to, to, uh, to the visitors. Of course, they, they are receiving visitors uh, on the basis of their preferences. So days which are, uh, and times which are convenient for them, they decide on the quantity of groups and the quantity of people in, in one group. What is more important, uh, it created different opportunities for work for, uh, for local community, and now they are not uh, leaving their villages in order to look for jobs in urban areas. Finally, uh, Finca um, Huesquila is tackling one important issue in tourism, which is accessibility. They have uh, created seven lodges which are completely accessible for people in wheelchair or with reduced mobility. They have a network of trails which can be accessed with wheelchairs and have educated other service providers to receive people who have disabilities. They have even created their own travel agency which is specialized in this kind of tourism experience. And finally, there are Mayan tourism cooperatives of Mexico. They're located in Yucatan Peninsula, which is the most touristic part of, of Mexico. They have received 14 million tourist arrivals last year. So in order to uh, benefit from these movements and to uh, sort of disperse the, the quantity of tourists present in Riviera Maya, many different communities established their cooperatives and started to offer experiences uh, based in their own communities, but as well offering tourism services. So uh, they started over excursions, accommodation, uh, food provided by the families. At the same time, it established uh, job opportunities for, for youth, empowerment for, for women, so that many of them, in the end, what is the, the case with Huasquila as well, did not leave their communities but stayed there to dedicate to the local tourism project. Uh, in order to sell these experiences and to, and to receive visitors, they collaborate with two operators which are highly specialized in, uh, in um, community-based and rural experiences. So they as well decide on quantity of people, how many times they can receive uh, groups and how many of them can actually stay in the community. Why? Because tourism is alternative uh, activity. It is not primary because agriculture and artisanal pr uh, production are two principal activities. Income from tourism, as it is as well case with many other uh, cases, is supporting protection of nature, is supporting main economic activity and provides sufficient funds to support education. <laughs> Moreover, for example, person on this photo is actually uh, looking for endangered animal species around Yucatan Peninsula. He's bringing them to his own property and then he's breeding them for, for several years until they reach number which is sufficient to be then released in wildlife. So far he, uh, he has breeded su successfully more than five um, uh, animal species, of course, in accordance with Ministry of environment and, and protection. On the basis of all these experiences, uh, we are creating a report which will try to highlight and emphasize all best practices applied. Why? Because as I mentioned, uh, these are not exclusive for Latin America or, or for these countries. Contrary, they can be applied in Africa as we uh, spoke previously, or in Asia, or even in Europe, 
at the same time, we are trying to understand challenges present and uh, to make it useful for academia or public sector to try to look for solutions for these challenges. By, find, by, by finding these solutions, we are able to tackle these issues on a, on a much uh, global level and uh, try to understand how tourism can respond to the challenges of climate change and sustainable development goals. As a summary, I can just briefly summarize that uh, uh, we understood that for sure uh, embracing sustainable models or applying sustainable practices is not undermining profitability. In fact, uh, many of these initiatives, above all these four, are managing to create sufficient funds to support through tourism other their activities. On the other hand, as I mentioned previously, many of the practices should be and can be uh, introduced in local policies or laws in order to inspire their, their application uh, in, in, in tourism and in one much massive, massive environment. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. You had some really good examples from your experience in the Americas. Now we'll have the privilege to have the presentation from Rogelio, which also has a broad international experience. He has worked in projects in Spain, Oman, uh, Malaysia, Ethiopia, the Philippines, and uh, he will be talking also about uh, rural solutions and other experiences that he has worked with. Just give me a second to pass the presentation. are low. 2019, 500 years after Magellan set, uh, sailed and moved or explored the East, we are still sailing and exploring on how to find solutions and problems. Very good examples have been presented in the first session on how we are embarking and developing our society in terms of knowledge management, digitalization, artificial intelligence, but let be honest, let us be honest that in some parts of the world, there are even much more problems that are not as what we have seen earlier, or the, the, the situation, what we have seen earlier, but 
sometimes the basic necessity or services are not even available. And this is really the reality what's going on, especially when we talk about the countries or we, we can say less developed countries or in the global south. Now, um, in terms of this, destinations or countries experience problems such as lack of awareness and understanding, resources, they have also absence of relevant institutions to manage in terms of their capacity. When we talk about destination, we have this problem of weak destination management organizations, power imbalances between government and institutions, as well as we can say the social political constraints, which are really true and happening, just like also what Stefan had presented earlier. Now, in terms of this, we all know that tourism is considered the largest economic sector and it generates millions of jobs and positively impact different or other several sectors. It is considered one of the major players of international commerce and has impacted even our um, other sectors in terms of job creation and export in terms of export earnings. And no doubt about it, tourism is here and it will stay. Whether we like it or not, and some people also argue about whether there is over tourism, the problem in terms of how we need to manage overcrowding and pollution, we need also to look on the positive impacts and effects of tourism in our society. Now, how can then we achieve sustainable and inclusive development for destination communities and how we can link that to circular economy. When we talk about these three terms, sustainability, we all know about meeting the needs and aspirations today as well as the future generations. We also have the, sorry. We also have destination communities when we talk about destination communities, these are locations where natural and human elements, where tourists experience the place and at the same time where tourist, tourism products are produced. This is according to Singh, Timothy, and Dowling. When we talk about circular economy, I think everybody should understand and know that circular economy is more to value creation how we actually regenerate, reuse, and apply the recycling as well as other uh, sources in order to reuse and cycle that in our society. And that's very important. Now, the question of course lies on how can we really achieve sustainability? Well, for me, and based on several research, it is through capacity development. Why? because it is the tool or the means to sustainable development. It resolves human capital gap, which is of course we always highlight about social capital. And at the same time, development can be dispersed from tourism or destination hotspots to the low density areas, marginalized or rural areas. And this is very important when we, have, we are now discussing so many issues about, like for example, over tourism and how we need to channel or decentralize development from those areas and how to really need to manage that in our society, not only in urban centers, but also in peripheral or other territor territories. Yet we have also capacity development challenges that also confronting nowadays, when you talk about complex issues that beset in terms of the various actors, organizations, and institutions, we have also this, we need to look at it, how important it is in terms of ownership, process, and system, as well as potential interventions among stakeholders, and finding a better inclusive and sustainable approach at the same time, how we need to look at it as an adult learning approach or way. Meaning to say, 
how we really need to inculcate capacity development in the sense that it is really to empower people and society. And this is really important. Now, let me share you about these brief preliminary results of my study. It is, of course, of, in my interest, at the same time, the research that I am conducting right now about capacity development in tourism. It is more of the approach is pragmatic, wherein no particular or one system of uh, philosophy or reality. So here, um, first, based on systematic literature review, valid documents from a number of papers, it has been found out that capacity building or capacity development can be categorically categorically link to, first, knowledge management. So most of the papers are actually uh, discussing or linking this issue about human capital or capacity development in terms of knowledge management, which is around 25% of the papers reviewed. Second, it's more to community empowerment and development which is around 27.8%, okay? Lastly, which is not, of course, surprising to all, and because this is, I think, highly, uh, meaning to say, significant, and we always discuss about this, most of the research are linked directly to networks and governance, which is 47.8% or around almost half of all our literature, projects, technical papers, reports, are directed or discussing about networks and governance. Just to have a preview, you can see here about the, I only took here about the area or category of networks and governance. Here you can see, sorry for that. Here you can see that 79% think that is really understandable and logical because capacity development mostly for to develop capacity of people in this part. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only applicable to less developed or developing countries. These are also required in the developed world because even in our societies, in the global north, we still have this necessity to really develop and empower people in some of our communities, even in Portugal. In addition, I would like also to share some of the experiences I had through immersion and participant observation. So first, capacity development in Ethiopia. Here, the picture here shows about it's more of tourism education training where we had this capacity building for tourism program in one university and then later on dispersed or framed for the development of curriculum in the whole country for tourism program. Okay, so this, that is the first photo. The second one is more to the tour guide training. The tour guide training is all about professionalizing the tour guide operation and businesses in Ethiopia. Just to inform you that during that time when I was there, we were the first batch of expatriates as well as capacity developers and builders, educators, in terms in, in the field of tourism. So after such, as we have already formed and provided education to some of the locals, they have continued that to other universities in the country. The same with goes with the last picture there. It's all about event management program, a formal and informal training where they are uh, to be trained like professional event management organizers. And at the same time, they have also developed it or this, uh, transferred the knowledge to other areas in Ethiopia. Here, we have capacity development in Oman. This is in Misfat al-Abriin, which is quite a 
not so far from Musca, the capital. This represents about transforming idle properties into useful tourism assets. It's, it's, it's not only in Oman, there are also other places where I have observed and most of us that there are some facilities or resources that are not utilized. And this is a good example where it has been there unused for quite a long time under the Ministry of Tourism and a local community embraced and started a project out of it by converting this facility of a heritage house into a really operational heritage uh, uh, house and visitor center, at the same time a trekking center, run by a local community group of 40 members, and especially the women are part also, because in uh, a different, in the context of culture, women needs also participation, but in the Muslim world, it's quite different. But here, they have really that kind of participation to that local community project where they prepare the food and sell to the tourists. At the same time, they make the souvenirs for the tourists. So this is quite outstanding in the sense that it's not a big project, but it's actually turned into something that the community has benefited from. So it has a uh, duration of five years from 2016 to 2021 and subject for renewal under the Ministry of Tourism of Oman. The next one is the capacity development in Portugal. This is more of a multidisciplinary approach of capacity building program towards GU parks, sustainable regional development, and healthy lifestyle. So it's more of interdisciplinary wherein private sector, public, as well as individuals, managers, can participate in order to broaden and apply techniques in terms of effective management strategies towards environment, natural and cultural heritage, as well as healthy living. And this happened last year, July in 2018. Now, when I talk about all of this, and we had the discussion on the first session about so many things when you talk about digital trends and circular economy, I think everybody will agree that the solution to our problems now, whatever it is, either in the aspect of different sector, technology, artificial intelligence, over tourism, etc., it's all about human capital. People is the answer or the key. And it is only through that, by developing the capacity of people, that we can resolve or solve problems. Yet, in this context, I would like to highlight four points that are quite important when we really apply techniques or methods approach in a destination or a society or a place. First, governance or structure, policies. These are very important. We always keep on talking because as I have explained earlier, the situation on the West and the global North totally different from the global South. And I can attest to that. I'm also from the, the Far East or officially from the Far East, then you can see the kind of difference. Even when you go to the Middle East and Africa, it's totally different. So sometimes when you have people, experts from other countries and coming there and apply something new for a project or a research, sometimes we bring things what we applied there from original, from original country, from the origin, yet, we need to understand also that there are so many factors to consider. And what should I say is that governance and structure is very important. The policies we need to follow or understand because what we know, even though how expert we are, we, it might not be that significant later on because the policies and regulation of that destination or country will not really support what actually from the outside. 
And we need to understand that. That's why you need to have this kind of discussion and agreement. Second, culture. Culture plays a vital role. No matter where you are from, you need to understand the culture of the host community where you are taking part, either it's a project or when you are visiting the place. Because this is how you can manage well because you are alien, or we can say you are foreign to the land and you need to understand what actually, how the people behave in terms of their norms and traditions. And this is very important. Even in um, crafting new laws or policies, sometimes we need to have this, meaning to say inculcated in the law. And one good example, when we talk about the, uh, for example, our Muslim brothers and sisters. So when we draft laws and regulation, we need to also take into consideration religion, as well as other countries. Like for example, when you go to Nepal or Indonesia, you have or the, the diverse group of ethnic groups, you need to really understand what's actually allowed and not allowed. In Indonesia, for example, um, they have even this, this type of governance or approach where the culture, where the community is taken part in drafting the, the law of a particular community. I'm not sure, I think it's in Bali, wherein, because it's quite unique, it's more of the combination of religion, aesthetic, as well as environment put together in creating a law for the people of, of that community. So this is really important as well because we need to really appreciate at the same time, give importance to the, to the community or the people. Voluntary commitment. Many times, okay, we have experts coming from abroad and all maybe within a country that develop or providing capacity, empowering people, projects, training, education, Yet, of course, they are being funded. But it's also important to consider how we can actually contribute in terms of developing and sharing what we have with our knowledge and skills to others. I have this experience in Ethiopia, like in 2005 to 2008, where you have expatriates working there because that's the time when the country really needs more experts to develop the economy in terms of tourism and education. Yet, the thing is, we also need people who can give volunteer or volunteerism or work to the society. Not only in the aspect of providing the expertise based on a particular uh, contract or project, because it will also make it significant for the people to understand and to embrace that kind of assistance that you are giving to them. There is some sort of emotional attachment or that kind of feeling that, oh yes, we are being taken care of and we are not just being taken just to have for this budget or funding. So this is really important for us to consider. And the most important thing is on networks and partnership. All about this literature study, and even uh, I think you will agree, even from the very beginning, you have mentioned about the crucial role of collaboration or networks, partnerships. I think everywhere, not only in tourism, whether in uh, econ economics or other fields, it's really important to have this because through networks or partnerships, we can build success and momentum towards sustainability. Okay? Collaborative management and even the participation of different stakeholders are really important. Without the partnership, like for example, uh, like now in Portugal or the Far East or the South, countries from the uh, developing world, if we have partnership because we have uh, resources or knowledge expert here and there. They have also some resource, but they don't have the expertise. So we can have that kind of partnership in, in both ways, in the form of finance or in the forms of knowledge 
management or sharing or in other forms. And this is really important. Yes. And last, how can we then develop destinations into sustainable, innovative, and inclusive communities? Just like Magellan and Sebastian Elcano, who are the first, we were considered the first circumnavigators of the world, we need also to sail and explore, find solutions. But we need to accept the fact that each one of us is different. And we need to find solution also in a different way. No, no particular or single thing fits also for, I mean, say, applied to all. So we have cultures, we have differences. At the same time, we need also to consider the different factors besetting our society nowadays. Now, are we ready to set the, to achieve the target by 2030 where no one needs to be left behind? And that is the important thing, the question. We are doing a lot of things, but we need to take and remind ourselves that in other parts of the world, we also have the situation where things are not the same with the other countries. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Rogelio. Now I would like to call again our speakers of this second panel so that we can answer some of the questions that may come from the public or from the online audience. Please join me here on the... Can you say that? Okay. I wish to have other. So before we hear our, our audience, um, I think we have been talking a lot about collaboration. And we talked about many stakeholders that participate in this process. But in the case of tourism, uh, what, what I would like to, to ask you is, what are the roles for each of the stakeholders which participate in, the, in this process? I don't know if, Stephanie you want to, to start? Maybe we can speak from different points of uh, yeah. view that maybe, that yeah. maybe Chinsia can speak about public sector I while, while yeah. I can go more to this private businesses, Maybe you know. Public side. Uh, the public in terms of destination management uh, organization, which are more, mostly uh, the public authorities, local, uh, local or regional level. So from this point of view, uh, collaboration is a key component. And uh, in the case of uh, ATIS, for example, for the implementation of the European Tourism Indicator System, uh, it was foreseen a, a stakeholder, the establishment of a stakeholder working groups where the public uh, authority has to coordinate, has to take the lead, but needs the collaboration and the, the uh, involvement also of the private sector because once that you have to share the information and you have to gather all the information from the sources, you need a collaboration. You need to, to take on board not only, uh, let's say, the public authorities, but also the SMEs, the universities, the, the uh, producers, the, the, the tourists, the, the local communities as well. So also the local communities. That was a very, very important uh, uh, issue. And uh, there are successful uh, uh, cases in Europe, like uh, some countries like in Slovenia, uh, in uh, Netherlands, uh, also in Spain. They are quite advanced. They understood that it's important to, to, be, to establish this partnership. So that's, uh, but uh, the public sector has to uh, take the lead. That was, for me, that's also, uh, it's the most important thing. As he said before, um, the governance, the structure is the pillar. So mm -hmm. the legislation is, is as well, uh, is the, the the main component, and then and then we have to be uh, aligned to this. So, so what, what would level. be the recommendation that we should give for the engagement of, uh, for instance, we have SMEs, which work with iTour, which are the main part of iTour, and uh, and in the economy in Portugal, for instance, what what would be their action, what would be their engagement in these in these issues, or how should they address this? Well, for example. 
there, uh, there was an interesting case which as well Professor Bohales mentioned about delivering the information between different bodies and these maps uh, of, of the movement in, the, in a destination or, or the case of, of taxis and, and cruises. And also it is the case when there is no collaboration, but they need to understand you know, that better goals or more productive or more efficient management will be established through, the, through a collaboration. Secondly, I believe that all of them have different type of of, uh, of responsibility where, for example, more and more tourists are uh, looking for uh, companies who are transparent, who, who publish uh, information as, as it is or where they mention impact, such as, for example, uh, there are booking platforms like Book Different who uh, put you on the website the carbon footprint that you make if you stay in a certain hotel or that there are uh, many uh, tour operators who uh, create their own foundations supporting local projects which are later on parts of their itineraries. So, you know, for example, they uh, provide uh, economic stability for these small and medium enterprises in a long term by giving them opportunity not only to develop their activities bar, but to actually involve them in their itineraries and to bring their groups. GIA Adventures is doing that, Intrepid is doing that from Australia, Ventura from Germany is doing that, so there are quite a few this so kind we of... We have a lot of examples, let's say. Yes, 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 there are, there are, who are, but I mean, those are examples from different countries, so we are not still on a, in a moment where it is a, a common thingy. There are rather just, you know, positive uh, examples from, from different parts of the, of the world. And so, and maybe, Rogelio, we can have also your view regarding this, because we are talking about these topics, and it's mainly like the demand side, which is demanding these, yeah. these kinds of, of, uh, of the development from the, from the companies. What, what do you think about uh, this topic? Okay, to tell you honestly, because of the previous experience, it's quite difficult to, to really form uh, or to meet, but I think one thing is for sure, you need to have that kind of uh, organizations or individuals who are proactive at the same time they have the initiative to do it because sometimes as what uh, Cynthia said is on the from the public sector side that they need to start in order to really do something for the community or about uh, collaboration but sometimes it doesn't happen just to give you an example um, I have read a lot of articles and, and research about it that okay there are so many types of governance or system top down bottom yeah. ups uh, consultative etc that one could work maybe in europe or in the global north but in some places like when you go for example in the middle east or in other countries where type of system is quite different or we can say restrictive mm. you need to find a different way on how to really collaborate and that could only mean by directly discussing to the main stakeholder in that destination or organization. Meaning to say, you try your best to, to, to start from yourself and work together with the government on how they can deliver that. In a society where there is democracy and freedom and more consultative, there will be no problem because everybody can really initiate and do and start. And that is fine and okay in most of, in Europe, West, but not maybe in some other countries. And we need to un understand this in, 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 in such context because sometimes when an expert comes from, the, uh, for example, from Europe and going to other places in the developing world, they would like to implement something that they have applied or they would like to do based on EU regulation, etc. But sometimes we are, the, the people also lack that kind of understanding that there are so many things that they need to consider. Like for example, when I was in Ethiopia, the, kind, the system of bureaucracy also, you need to, to, to weigh or understand even how good your plan and your system and your proposal if the bureaucracy is, will, will take you a lot of time to proceed to that, so sometimes it really is not, it's difficult, but you need to find some ways. And that way, I believe is only you put together the different stakeholders, and sometimes 
It takes a lot of effort yeah. to invite them. Sometimes you need to spend more money to invite them and involve them, but you need to do because that's the only way you can really fulfill that kind of goal for the community. That's what, based on my experience. Yeah. Uh, can I add, uh, yes, can yes, I add something just uh, related to what uh, the professor said right now? Uh, in, uh, there is an example in Belgium, in the, the city, it's a university city of, of Louvain, and uh, the mayor, who, who is a uh, very new, new, new one, he, he won the election uh, one year ago, he, uh, he, got, he got an award, an award for this involvement of the community because he was using a kind of horizontal collaborative approach, meaning that he consulted the community. First of all, he set up three priorities. He said, we want to achieve those goals. We want to become free car city, meaning that all the old town must be for cycle, only for cycle, and also pedestrian, no car, no car. So uh, we want to achieve the target of the uh, uh, reduction of CO2 emissions, so we, want to, we wanted to involve also the, the, uh, the residents to use uh, renewable energy. So he set, he set up three main priorities. Consulting the people took time, took time, but now, two years later, so now he's in the way of uh, the dynamic process, but he said that uh, the, the community, the response of the community was very, very but high. Was, was that a, a prior consultation to the decision? Yes, or it was after? No, no, it was the, cons the, 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 the mayor he engaged all the people, private and public also institution, meaning university students, uh, museums, uh, everybody, every type of stakeholders, but the process was consultation, listening to, and also taking on board the, 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 the let's say, the input, and, and then the, uh, sharing the goals. That was a, a common process, and they achieved the goal. They, they were, they've been awarded as a sustainable city in Belgium from the region, uh, from the, the national level, because they are de demonstrating that in, with this approach, capacity building also, uh, uh, process, uh, they can achieve the goals, but together, not with this top-down uh, imposition uh, from so the, the traditional but in the yeah. same type of time, policy. in the same time, the long-term vision of the policy makers must be in line with the international guidelines, yes. the umbrella that we were saying before, the 2030 agenda, because at least there is a, a global perspective that, that, of course, has to be tackled according to the type of uh, uh, realities, because yeah. in, in the world we don't have the same type of systems, but political system or, or, or democracy or a lack of democracies or even the nature, the landscapes are, yes. are different. We have to consider this, but yeah. that's the approach. So, and that's the way that maybe erase awareness, be aware, yeah. being aware. So that's okay. uh, and may, I the still process. have some questions for you, but I don't know if we have any questions from the room. If, if you have, you may do them now. No, but I'm also seeing here on our online stream, we have a question uh, regarding how can individuals, the local community and uh, micro, small, medium enterprises be encouraged to venture into this kind of sustainable businesses. Uh, and uh, and uh, <laughs> the confrontation with the multinational companies also. Uh, how do you see well, this? That's a good. That's a good question, and uh, it is always a topic. Uh, well, in order to inspire this, you know, uh, application of sustainable, or at least to try to act sustainably uh, from po policies point of view, you know, uh, government can establish legislation which is awarding sustainable purpose. So, for example, for uh, protecting a certain amount of, of land or for uh, uh, giving a certain amount of uh, employment for local people, there are least, less taxes to, to pay or they can have uh, uh, access to additional funding opportunities or for vocational training which is free of charge or that they can participate in international fairs. Many of them do not go to fairs simply because it is too expensive for one small and medium enterprise to actually participate, but yeah. if you know you provide them access to 
be pr presented in I ITB Berlin or WTM or FITUR by simply, you know, mm. applying a series of uh, policies or, or practices over one, a certain period of time, you know, they can actually think, you know, in advance and, and applying that time so that they will be able to, for example, free of charge, be present on these, uh, on these events. Moreover, for example, there is an uh, example from Ecuador. Uh, Ministry of Tourism uh, established collaboration with TourCert, which is one of uh, certifications. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they provided 50% help to every uh, enterprise who wanted to cer certify their business with this certification. So many hotels, tour operators applied. Mm -hmm. But they, small businesses? Yes, yeah. small. It's uh, not we, only we have, to the main no, chains? No, no, we have visited Ecolodge, which in total has five people working there, of which one is the, the family, so uh, husband and a wife, and there are three other people. So, and it, they have maybe seven lodges in total. It's quite small initiative, right? It mm -hmm. is. It, it goes in the ca category of a, of a small hotel, you know, a, a boutique. And they received 50% help from Ministry of Tourism in order to receive this certification. Mm -hmm. And they told us it helps a lot. Not but maybe. afterwards, it was being taking that choice to, to that path. It, it's still uh, rentable. It's something that uh, they have seen value in it. Yeah, uh, they they seen value from inside point of view. They said it helped us amazingly to uh, organize our businesses to be more productive, more efficient, to decrease costs, to use other source uh, technologies or tools. Mm -hmm. Maybe it didn't bring more clients because no, nobody is calling a hotel saying I want to book stay because you are certified. No, yeah. but it's tour operator one major tour will probably uh, uh, take you as a partner if they see that you are certified. So, okay. you know, they, they, they told us honestly, it helped us greatly inside, but, you know, we didn't receive any client who specifically came because of that. Okay. Uh, Rogel, I don't know if you want to... I think to... Uh, when we would like to encourage MSMEs, it's more of how the... First, of course, the public sector, the government, is very important, their role how they really need to make plans on encouraging the local people and soon-to-be entrepreneurs to have this type of business, and that's very important. Another thing is the academic institutions. Um, we, uh, in, the in previous years, I have attended several uh, forum or conferences in terms of SMEs and entrepreneurship. One thing is for sure that we need to have entrepreneurship courses or programs inculcated in our curriculum or curricula. And that is very important because either way, from the government side, they need to initiate, but the academic side, they need also to do that in, because they have that kind of access to educate the young minds. And only through that also that these people can be encouraged. Now. In terms of the people, the students, or maybe young graduates, or others who would like to venture in businesses, small enterprises, what we can do also, on the side of private associations and governments, one thing that really works well and proven is through a rewarding system. Rewarding system in the sense that, like for example, a local government unit can provide some sort of uh, prices, incentives to those organizations or entrepreneurs when they become successful or start up, having their startup or business, and from there you encourage, motivate these people to do more. It's not easy, but it works well, and it has been proven also in several places, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world, because Oh, through that, you are providing motivation to people. We all know that the resources are quite difficult sometimes, especially when we talk about finance, especially in the less developed countries. But one way, for example, incentives or uh, this kind of prices can work even non-monetary, or you need to have a partnership with some private enterprises. So some of these private enterprises or organizations are also uh, would like to, to really partner with the local government unit 
like for example, the municipality, city, uh, province, or the regional level. And from there, they can have assistance in terms of providing finance or other resource for these young entrepreneurs or individuals. Because we really need to have them to be, become job creators rather than employees only in the sector. So I have here another question online. Is directed towards uh, Mr. Lazic. Uh, what were your biggest challenges during your work in uh, South America, and what do you plan on doing next? Well, challenging in particular in communicating with initiatives is, you know, how to explain them in the right way, the benefits of, of the practices they can do, or in a sustainable approach to a certain topic and to understand that you're not trying to order someone to do something, but you know. But to engage. To engage as well, you know, to, that they can understand the, the benefits, the positive effects of their own action, because it is not. Uh, so it's, it's also a matter of communication. Yes, it's you know, a, it's co communication is crucial, yeah, because you cannot just say to someone, you know, you need to do this, you know, or stop doing a certain thing in order to to have this positive effect, but to explain, you know, why is it important to do it and how in a long term it can be um, beneficial as well. Uh, cultural differences as well as, as Rogelio mentioned, it's quite important to understand the local environment, the, the, the tradition, heritage, you know, going, for example, to, to Colombia, with, uh, who suffered you know, for uh, 30 or 40 years of, uh, of internal uh, armed conflict, you know, it, it is important that you know it be, before yeah. going there and know how to adapt to a, to a, to a situation. So challenges, of course, to understand how to, to communicate in the best way with, uh, with them. Yeah, I, I will have uh, here a last question and maybe uh, to Cizia, then you, you can all share your views regarding, because we are talking here about future trends, maybe, what would be your bets on uh, circular businesses related to tourism? If you have to choose some actions or type of, uh, of business, what's, what would be your bets? Uh, from which point of view? The point of view of the private sector uh, or, or, of the, or the... the yeah, <laughs> because it's always, it's very important to have in mind what, from what perspective we have to Yeah, approach. from the private sector. Yeah. From the private sector. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to add what uh, before uh, Roche, Roche said about the importance of uh, involvement also of the association of SMEs or I'm, I'm thinking about the Chambers of Commerce, for example. So it, it, this, this uh, um, collaboration, this partnership is fundamental to achieve the results. Therefore, the SMEs uh, in, in this uh, process of circular economy implementation uh, to be aware about the benefits, they should uh, establish more collaboration and partnership with the chambers of commerce because they can provide public incentives. They can uh, somehow, they can motivate more the uh, uh, SMEs to be uh, fully committed and not because only because it's on voluntary basis process. Of course, they must be, uh, that's the only way to be uh, today, to be not green as easy, but to be really in line with the priorities of, of the challenges that we have to uh, uh, fulfill. Therefore, uh, I will see more uh, the importance of this uh, process of uh, uh, partnership between the SMEs and uh, or or better, more relation between the, the chambers of commerce or other associations representing the SMEs and the work, the daily based work of the SMEs in terms of improving their services, uh, the quality of their services, the sustainability to become more sustainable. And being aware about what circular economy means, reuse, recycle, so what are the, 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 the focus? Uh, waste, uh, food management, uh, production of the electricity, the water consumption. So all these uh, uh, achievements, not, they do not need the, the label. Maybe the certification is just the last 
thing is the process that they have to take in, into account. They're more than the certification, the last, because some SMEs thinking about, for example, Ecolabel or AMAS, uh, they think more bothered. They, they, they feel that, ah, oh, I'm, I'm bothered for this, all these uh, uh, procedures because I have to invest my money and then I don't see uh, the, the number of uh, consumers uh, increasing because of this. So maybe uh, not just focus on the last step of the <laughs> achieving the, the label, reviewing the whole but process. It's reviewing the process and, and, and changing the, the daily basis, like the, the, uh, the hotel, uh, Martin's Hotel chain is doing uh, uh, in, in, in the overall picture. So that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the secret economy. It's having in mind that the overall process of the value chain. It's knowing from better your business and then understanding what... Knowing better from where you start and where you mm -hmm. want to arrive, but take into account all these steps. Okay. And then, I of don't know course, if, uh, I guess we are very, very something. complementary in this. <laughs> I was having just a thought because our topic about circular economy, and of course, celebrating the 500 years of Magellan's navigation, when uh, Ferdinand Magellan sailed and discovered the far is the looking for the spice islands well i think he for, for himself he discovered that totally different world a new world and i think that's the reality that what we are doing right now here in our place is totally also different from other side of the world we it's true that we follow the the, the primary uh, law in terms of all of these, like for example, the UN agenda for 2030 is very crucial because all member countries sign and need to abide with that. Yet, some countries are far more advanced and some are quite middle and others are left behind, some somewhat trailing. And this we need to consider. The digital, digitalization, artificial intelligence really work well in major economies, industrial economies, because they have all the infrastructure and superstructure to support this development. While those countries, LDC is least developing or trailing, we need to really support them more because uh, I think they have discussed earlier about Africa that moving from uh, 3G to 5G, the kind of infrastructure, well, when it's good. But it's not only about this kind of amenities or services. There are other services or infrastructure that are most important in other communities. Like for example, some other communities, they don't even have that access to water, okay? Some other communities, they don't have even that uh, job, meaning to say that the people. So, you need to support first these basic priorities, and I believe other things will follow if you provide these basic services. Mm. In the case of tourism, tourism already provided several proof that impact the, in terms of either economic, social, cultural, to the community, and that's how we also embrace tourism to these communities. How we involve circular economy principles, like for example, if you are traveler from Europe and you're going to Africa, well, first of course, we need to research and what actually is all about the destination that we're going to. We don't expect the same kind of conveniences if you are from Portugal or other countries from Europe. Second, if we really like to embrace and achieve at least the target of SDG, we need to look or consider like how to use more fuel efficient airplanes when we travel, travel light. So these are some examples. And at the same time, you need, uh, this is a very good example. When you visit a place, buy things made by the local people. And that is very important, especially in this times of globalized, open uh, trade liberalization, and we have products, souvenirs of Portugal made from another country, I don't think that that helped much to support our local community here. So we need to buy local, support local, 
in order to boost also our community. Yes. Because only which is in line with uh, circular yes, economy and the, principles. That is also. the this is the most important factor. So from the from the local people and outsiders, we need to understand this that it's not only you are not only having that kind of uh, meaning to say prestige or something from that place, but you are helping more the people at the same time the local economy. Another example is on unused facilities. Many times, even in the developed world, we have a lot of properties, utilities, or facilities that are left unused or unutilized. It's a time to we really need to think about to utilize that because we can convert them, we can use that. One example I have given in Oman, it's been, it's like uh, being constructed for more than 10 years and nothing happened. But because of the initiative, bottom-up approach, from the local people, yes. Because they, actually the story of that local community, they learned it from one person who have a tourism background. Because of the knowledge and education of one, he created change to the local people that we can do something out of nothing from, from this place. So this is, are the kind of simple things that we can do. Yes. Maybe we have to conclude, but Stefan, if you want I to add. Connect this topic with circle trends and, and information technology we spoke previously of. I believe that probably uh, one of the crucial roles in, in future circular trends will, will play both artificial intelligence we, we spoke and the use of technology, how to adapt the machines or uh, productive processes in order to be more efficient, to function better and to, uh, to decrease the cost instead of creating machines which are disposed after a certain amount of time. So we are making them more efficient, just to uh, change the parts which are not functioning. Uh, to use technology for more re renewable sources, uh, as well as Jason spoke about Martin's hotels. There are more other European hotels adapting to this, so using technology to create these uh, resources we, which can actually uh, establish more efficient and more productive uh, processes, uh, which Rogelio mentioned the, the use of uh, abandoned places. There is the concept of uh, albergi diffusi or uh, di diffused uh, hotels, which is now existing for the last 25 or 30 years, which the whole villages or abandoned cities are uh, uh, turned into hotels and uh, experiences. So not uh, just um, creating a new hotel, which is a part of a resort or something, but actually using houses, farms uh, adapted yeah. to receive visitors. It is, now, it is all over the world, but now for China is investing a lot in that, so this trend for them is already having its 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 uh, movement. Can I add just a yes, little uh, just sentence? Remark, yeah, no, just it. because we, we are thinking about trends, future trends, but if we uh, think about circular economy, it's something very old. It's coming from our grandparents. It's something that it's related to our historical background because in the past, because we don't have we didn't have the means. To, to, to eat or to, 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 to satisfy our needs. So it was necessary to reuse everything we were using for. And, and, Therefore, yeah. what is new, what is new is the combination with the technologies and innovation. That's, what, that's the new challenge. So to combine something which is coming from the past and we have to add our behavior. We have to be aware and to change our behavior because unfortunately during the, the, the period, the previous period, the 80s, let's say, we were, we were especially in the, uh, other, in the European country or in the Western countries, we were, we were without limit. We were using resources without any limit. Now it's time to limit. To limit, but starting from our own behavior. Yes. At home, domestic. As I said and, before, and I was mentioning the impact in the, in the, in the secure economy, the percentage was uh, the food waste, but also, of, also in the domestic households. It means that we are not taking care of this. We think we talk about it, but we don't do. So yes. switch into the action. And, what and we that, think that about. is also why, why we are revisiting tourism. It's also a, Looking also forward, but also back. And also see back, what... because it's, uh, it's important. And just to, okay. to finish, uh, one week ago in, in, at the European Parliament, we had a conference, because I'm a member of the TRAN, uh, in the TRAN committee of this uh, tourism task force,
force. I've been invited by the map uh, is one, is one, uh, uh, is, uh, surname is Hungary, I, I, don't, uh, I don't remember the, the surname. But anyway, the topic was uh, cruise, cruise, sustainable cruise. Mm. Sustainable cruise, because cruise is crucial as well for the transport, the impact, the environmental impact of cruises. And they are now changing in more sustainable direction, way. They were demonstrating with the data and figures that in the last two years, they were achieving a specific uh, uh, target, uh, for example, for the fuel, green fuel. Yes. Uh, renewal, they the, the yeah. were uh, recycling the material from the, the, the new vessels. So that's something that they are taking into account of the food waste in, on, the, on, the, on the boat. So they were demonstrating that even the crews, if, even if the reputation is very bad <laughs> because they are impacting a lot the destinations, unfortunately, but at least they are trying to change their, uh, their uh, let's say, their uh, business model this, to become more sustainable. So uh, the cruise, that's just to, to say that we have to consider the holistic picture in front of us, not just one sector. Also because tourism is transversal, is touching uh, different type of... Uh, Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I would like to ask for a big round of applause for our... <laughs> Now we will present some conclusions, if please take your seats. So I'll just summarize very quickly some of the ideas that we have talked about today. So we have, uh, during the, our session, talked about the import, importance of networks and how they are essential and not really just the technologies, but rather how we are uh, connected and how we use the information and the, the transmission of that information between different sources. We have talked about time factors and the nowness and the demands from the, from the, the consumers and the tourists who want to be satisfied immediately. Um, we have talked about uh, new solutions which are already in place and are not just fiction or something that we have uh, in a creative way thought about, but rather very specific examples like in the photos from Professor Dimitris and Professor Stanislav with those kinds of solutions that I have seen in close hand. We have uh, talked about how Razer um, can, uh, can enhance the capacities which of the activities which are made by other people and how they substitute us, but they substitute um, uh, specific tasks, let's say, not, not necessarily substituting our jobs, but rather uh, some tasks are more relevant to be done by these new technologies. Uh, regarding the second panel, we have also talked about links between the tourism and the circular economy. We have shown uh, various examples uh, from different geographies also. Uh, we have seen that food waste is one, uh, maybe a clue of uh, an area in which uh, tourism can really evolve and have an impact regarding what are, which is also a priority for the Commission, the European Commission regarding the circular economy. Uh, we have seen that there is a strong connection with the sustainable development goals and we have like uh, at least some compromise, international compromise regarding those topics, those topics. And we have seen that the education and training and the capacity development is a key for the change in the, in the tourism sector. Uh, and now I would like to ask uh, Luis Marx, which is uh, president of IATUR, to have some, just some last words. In the name of Ayatur, in my personal name, I want to, I would like to thank you to the University of Aveiro, Professor, dear Professor, thank you for your collaboration and your hand and your knowledge, thank you. We are, I want to also say thank you to our partners in the person of Hugo. 
University of Aveiro, great thank for hosting this event. And uh, a big, a big thank you to the speakers that come from far to share with, uh, with us their knowledge in a way, special way. And of course, to all who attended in person or online. See you next time and hope you have found this event very grateful. Thank you and see you again. Yeah, we would like to only call for a last time our, our speaker. So Professor Dimitris, please, if you can hear, have just a little gift and certificate. Thank you very much, Professor Stanislav. Cynthia, please. Professor Diogo will receive the through Professor Carlos Carlos because he had to, to leave the room. Stefan, please. And Rogelio. Of course, yes. And of course, last but not least, Professor Carlos Costa, uh, which made this event possible here in the university. Thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you for, thank you for joining us and a, a final round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>